All right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Stuart. Uh, my name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the Studio Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Stuart Elliott accepted our invitation to the show. Stuart, welcome to the show, man. Claudio, it's been a long time. I've been very unreliable. Um, in no, trying no, no, no. To... You're, you're good. People, people are busy. Don't worry, man. Um, <laughs> yes, you know, this has been a, a very weird period for everybody in the last two years with the pandemic. Uh, has the pandemic yeah. affected you, your life, your inability to tour, your sanity? How are you holding up, man? Uh, yeah, all of those things. It's yeah, it's affected all of those things. Um, I remember that when it when it fir the first um, lockdown that we had, um, the weather here was just beautiful. It was fantastic weather in March, mm -hmm. which would normally be a little bit chilly, but it was just like blazing hot, sunny every day for like three months. You know, yeah. so the first the first lockdown was was actually a lot of fun because um, I I did a lot of writing uh, in my studio. Uh, I think I wrote about 33 tracks for um, production music, you know, library music. Got it. So uh, it was a very creative time. And then in between that, I was sort of um, putting up new fencing in the garden in the sun and getting a tan. And it was fantastic. Um, but then as the sort of winter started approaching and we had another lockdown and then another lockdown in, in right in the winter, it started to get to me. Um, and I'm still a little affected by it now. It sort of knocked knocked the wind out of my sails in a lot of ways. And I, th I think it probably did that to everybody. You just get so fed up being restricted to have social contact. And not that I, I didn't you I don't really have a lot of social contact anyway, but having none was was a real problem. Um, and my father at the time was uh, 97 years old. Um, and he was just very frail, needed needed help. And for a few months, I, I couldn't, I wasn't even allowed to go and see him. It was it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, very stressful. Um, but um, now that it's over, you know, we're sort of slowly getting back in, in into things. Um, but it hasn't picked up as quickly as I'd like. Um, it would have been it would have been a lot more um, fruitful work wise if um, Steve Harley had gone out with the full band because he's done a lot he's done a lot of gigs like he did a lot of shows last year um but they were all acoustic just acoustic with a you know no drums so um i could have done with going out for a while to play because because it's it sort of it's you know for, for me playing live is like a sort of um it's like therapeutic it's like a healing thing for me when i play drums at an audience and a bit of a sweat you know come off yeah. stage to great applause it, it yeah lifts your spirits you know so um We'll be doing more of that in December, so um, maybe the healing will begin then. But um, it's been Good quite, yeah, it's been quite quite a, a blank sort of uh, period where you know the spirits get a bit low, and uh, you have to keep motivating yourself every day to sort of do stuff, you know. But um, it, everything's good now, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you you say that you like that music. For me, I, I live in the border with two different states, with Maryland and Washington D.C. And Virginia, yeah. so I'm able to see, I don't know, bet between 40 and 50 shows a year. So I'm I'm very lucky. Every band come here this way to Washington City. So, and right. my music is very important for me. I mean, it's I have a, a huge collection of music. You know, four floors full of music, and uh, but wow. seeing people playing live, it's it's amazing. I uh, it's like a ritual. Every time they go to a concert, it's it's amazing. So, so you must it's have been uh, you must have been affected quite negatively mentally but not being able to do that for two years uh yeah we couldn't uh, here in washington dc we of course you know in the united states over a million people die and some people believe in the vaccine some people didn't and everything is slowed down i began working from home i'm a, I'm a computer scientist i mean music is my passion and yeah. uh, and uh, i open one radio i send the link to friends they like it, then I open another one, another send another link, and I thought, well, you know, if musicians are not touring, everybody must be at home boring, bored. So I I began calling people, and uh, at the beginning, uh, nothing happened, and then eventually Steve Hackett get back to me. I was he was my first interview, believe it or not. Um, oh, so you started doing the interviews, but in in the during the pandemic. Correct. Yep. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good. That's a good way to get through it. Yeah, and I have done now 
I don't know, 250, 300. Uh, and it's, um, I'm very lucky, you know, but, uh, that I'm able to talk to great musicians, people who I, I admire for a long time, that I have right. records. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a person who, who bought his first record, her record 30, 40 years ago. So I have, like, you can see a little bit on the back, but I have, I don't know, be, between CDs, vinyl, Blu-ray, I don't know, 7,000, right. 8,000, for everything, your jazz rock, uh, electronic music, soundtrack. I have a wide range of stuff, you know, that right. I Right. So you won't, be, uh, you won't be switching over to Spotify too soon then? No, no, no. I like physical things. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I know. I, it's like a book, <laughs> right? I, I don't like reading PDF. I need the whole thing. I yeah, open, that's right. You know, open, open. It's still the same. It, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about... See, it's crazy with the guy because young kids, right? You know, they... You know, they don't buy CD. They download stuff. They listen to 10 seconds or so. Next, next, next. That's a, that's that's right. a very stupid that. way to live your life. I don't want to live it. You know, with a vinyl, you, you open it up. You look at the picture. It smells great. You look at the other side. Who played that? You put one side. You listen to a couple of times. You go to the other side. It, it, it are two different things. It's a, you know, it's a it's another ritual, as you said. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, sitting yeah, yeah. sitting down to listen to music is something that I always did as as a as a teenager, and even yeah. up into my sort of thirties and and slightly beyond. I would just, you know, when my wife was watching TV, I'd be in the corner in the same room with the hi fi system with my headphones on, listening to all my favorite albums. Same same here. Uh, my, <laughs> my 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 dad. I was born in Chile, and I came to the United States to to study. And um, my my dad had a huge amount of music, a lot, thousands. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, all jazz, you know, Kerry Roll Malt, Louis Armstrong, you know, and, and and tango from Argentina. So I began listening to music when I was a baby, yeah. little, little bit. And then when I was 14 or so, I discovered... Genesis and Peter Gabriel and the rest is history. You know, I I thought, man, I I don't like the music that my play, my dad play, but I like progressive rock and yeah. and, uh, and and the rest is you know history. I'm, I'm being very lucky in, in my life that I have a lot of schooling. I was like a scholar in many ways. I have done well, yeah. and that allowed me to travel to see band. You know, I I went to see the last shows of Genesis. Uh, this year, oh, uh, right, yeah. years, went to see uh, uh, Eric Clapton playing at the Royal Albert Hall again. So I'm very fortunate. So, and now I'm talking to you. <laughs> right. So for people that don't know, were you born like in a in a musical family? How old were you when you perhaps took you know guitar lesson, or piano lesson, or drum? How how the beginning? Yes. Of yeah, my father. My father was a drummer in in the big bands in the in the thirties, forties, fifties. Um, he used to be, uh, do you remember Lena Horn? Mm -hmm. He was her drummer when she came to Europe. Yeah. She used, she, she had her own band in, in America, but when she came to Europe, my dad was her drummer. Um, and after that, he, um, he sort of kind of did a lot of, he did a lot of, um, recording work. He did what they call broadcasts in those days. Most radio, most music was played on the radio and it was live music on the radio. So they'd always have a big band and they'd be playing music, um, reading music and just like for 45 minutes or, or a whole morning or whatever. Um, so he did broadcasts in the morning and in the evenings he'd be working in nightclubs. Uh, and then he, he ended up as a, a resident drummer at the Savoy hotel in London and he was there for about oh comes 20 20 odd years um and then he finally retired when he was in his 60s um and he only died last year he was, he, he lived until he was 98 and um wow. and there you go and he had a drum kit in his room right up to the end <laughs> good for you man. yeah good yeah for you. and then so what kind of what kind of music were you listening when you were i don't know 15 16 year old what kind of you well, basically. actually, but the, the first music I was introduced to would have been my dad's music because um, yeah. he used to he was just uh, he was obsessed with um, um, all of his sort of um, all of his peers at the time. And there was Duke Ellington. He, wow. he was he loved Duke Ellington. Um, and of course, you know, he was always playing Buddy Rich records. And um, 
uh, Dave Brubeck Quartet. And so I was kind of brought up on more jazz than anything up, up until up until I was, I think it was, I must have been about maybe nine, ten, something like that. And then the Beatles came out, yeah, and the Rolling Stones, wow. and that's that's where I switched. I thought, right, that's that's what I want to do. Now, I always wanted to play drums. I wanted to play drums, for, for, you know, since I was three. But I wasn't quite sure what kind of a drummer I would be. But then as soon as, you know, the, the Beatles and the Stones and the Who, um, two of which I actually worked with, you know, worked with two of the Beatles, you know, Paul and Ringo and um, and Roger Daltrey from the Who. So, you know, for me to and Jack Bruce from Cream, I, I played with him and did some recording. And it's like all these these records that were the the records I was listening to as a teenager all of a sudden i'm you know later in life i'm playing with those guys so it's like it's like it's like it's just like a dream come true that kind of thing but I, in answer to your question as as a teenager yeah i was listening to the beatles my first single that i ever bought was she loves you um and the first album i ever bought was um, please please me album the beatles first album yeah uh, and also i bought the the, uh, the rolling stones first album um and after that, I bought Who's Next, which is Won't Get Fooled Again and all that stuff with The Who. I bought that as well. So, yeah, it was mainstream pop was and rock was my thing. Good for you. Good for you. Have you ever looked back in your life? And then I know, you know, we'll be talking to all the people you have played, but you say, what the heck, man? I was a little kid, a shy kid, and... You know, 50 years later, if I review your life, you got played with everybody, man. It made you. Know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's over a long period of time. Um, I mean, I had a lot of periods in between where I'd be doing nothing for two months or, or a month here, a month there. Um, but yeah, I do. I do look back and I, 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 I it's, it's, it's all the most mixed feelings. I think, oh, my God, what if I hadn't had those introductions and if I hadn't met so and so? I would have never have worked with all these others, you know, right, um, right. because it was all, I mean, Co being in Cockney Rebel was what got me into the music business. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and that was a really lucky break because um, I, I was looking to join a band when I was a teenager. Um, and a friend of mine said, Oh, I got a friend, a, a bass player that's looking for a, looking for a drummer. I can't remember what his name was, but I called him up. I says, oh, hi, uh, I believe you're looking for a drummer. He says, oh, I've got a drummer now. But um, my friend, I've got a friend, Steve, that's looking for a drummer, Steve Harley. So that was, you know, if I hadn't met Steve, Cockney Rebel wouldn't have happened I mean, what, with me in it anyway. Um, and then when I think what that what that led to is, uh, well, for, for one, Alan Parsons produced Cockney Rebel on two yeah. albums. And also Andrew Powell, who was the orchestral arranger, yeah. worked on both those albums as well. And it was Andrew Powell that got me the Kate Bush gig. My God. And it, and it was Alan that got me um, Year of the Cat. That's right. Alan Stewart. I mean, it's like this little family w was gave birth to a whole load of um, fantastic albums and artists that I worked with that then course you know then i met people on those sessions all the great musicians on those sessions and then that's where all the sort of cross fertilization and the and the networking took place um and you know you'd you do an album with like the album i did with um uh with kate bush um had uh, uh david payton and ian benson from pilot as well and it just so happened that uh, Stuart Tosh, who was in their band as well, yeah. was part of the original project band. Um, the first two albums, I, Robot and Tales of Mystery, was yeah. Stuart, Stuart Tosh on drums. But then he joined 10CC. And because yeah. I did that Kate Bush album with yeah. Ian and David, uh, uh, Ian and yeah. David, hmm. they, they said, oh, Alan's, Alan's looking for a new drummer. And Alan knew me anyway. So they said, oh, what about Stuart Elliott? We've had a great, did a great album with him. It'd be great for the project. So Alan said, right, okay. So I was in the project, you know, and it's like the family thing just grew and grew and grew. And that's yeah. that's how it works. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Good, fantastic. Good for you. I interview uh, Dave Payton as well, and he's a very nice fellow. And uh, I, you know, we end 
um, he's kind of, you know, sick and um, I, he's not doing interviews, but I have met some of the people that he can play with and, uh, and I yeah. got to interview with Alan Parsons. Well, great, great musician. I feel very fortunate myself as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are great people. I, I, I think one of your, I read somewhere you're one of the big influences where Joe Morello and Buddy Rich for you. Oh, yeah. Well, both really. Um, yeah. I'm still inspired by both of them. Um, I think I think in my in my my style of playing, there's a little bit more Joe Morello than there is Buddy. Yeah. Uh, because he used to do all these sort of interesting sort of um, African type rhythms and things, but not not overtly, but um, that kind of captivated me. Um, and I, I remember um, I thought nothing of it. I didn't try and copy him ever, 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 ever. Um, but I listened to him and uh, I remember um, I was doing a recording with Steve Harley. This was in between bands. We didn't have the old band and the new band hadn't been formed yet. I think it was 1975. Um, and it eventually got, uh, there's a song called Throw Your Soul Down Here, which is a B-side to Here Comes the Sun, I think. And I was in the studio with Steve and we had Herbie Flowers on upright bass. And we had B.A. Robertson. Have you heard of him? No. Well, he was, he was he's called Brian Robertson then, but he became B.A. Robertson. And I played on, on a number one single of his later on, but he played piano. And we played this song and um, I did some drum fills at the end. And one of the drum fills that I played, B.A. B.A. Robertson said, ah, oh, Joe Morello. <laughs> and it was just a little thing that I did that I, I did it unconsciously, but it, it was very Joe Morello. And he noticed it. He, he, he knew what his playing was like and he noticed it. So I thought, you know, that's my, that there's an influence. You know, that's that's real influence when you do, you don't know something, you're doing something and, and someone else recognizes it. But uh, that kind of kind of tickled me. But yeah, Joe Morello was one of my all time favorite drummers. Yeah, good for you, man. Yeah. And um. Also, I, I noticed that you you admire as well Ringo Starr. You know, in your opinion, looking back, what's your what's your opinion that that you that you have that you think he was a good drummer and and the, he was very influential for future generations, right? So, oh my God, yeah. I I I only know one drummer that said he didn't like him. I won't say really? who it was. Yeah, yeah, he, and he's a good drummer as well, this guy. But he said, nah, I never liked his playing. Um. But every other drummer I've ever known, and all the best drummers in the world, maybe not Buddy Rich, because he didn't like anybody. <laughs> but, um, oh, we all love Ringo. Ringo is a fantastic drummer. I mean, it's very, um, it's very, uh, it's very subtle, the, the, the beautiful difference that he makes to those records. I mean, I can't think of one Beatles record where the drums weren't perfect. As it were, they're just absolutely spot on with timing, groove, taste, creativity. Um, you know, one of the highlights of my life was was playing live with him. Um, wow. We did uh, we did the Michael Jackson and Friends uh, show, which was a live uh, festival in Munich, um, and we came on with Ringo, and we did. I think we only did two songs. I think it was just Yellow Submarine and a little help from my friends. Yeah. But I have to say, you know, I've always said that every drum fill that Ringo ever composed was like a little piece of music in itself. And yeah. it's just so beautiful. And that drum fill, you know, um, on Little Help from My Friends, where it goes just, just after the chorus, it's before it goes into the second verse, it goes, da 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 boom, 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 da 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 that fill is just one of the most incredible drum fills that I think has ever been written because it, it is a million things Ringo could have done there, but he did that and it just, it kept it moving. It's a bit like old forties drumming, you know, where Gene Krupa used to do the Tom Tom. Boom, 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 boom. And it was just so, so beautiful and so musical that I actually had shivers up my spine when I played it behind him. Really? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I'm getting shivers now thinking about it because it's so, it's such a, such a, a, a musical little snippet of of drumming that doesn't interrupt the song, but it ties those two bits together beautifully. 
Ringo's Ringo is, did, did loads of that. I mean, this, oh, I can't I can't even begin to I can't don't know where to start. You know, to to say what a wonderful drummer he was. You listen to any anything they ever did, and it's just fantastic. Yeah, I never I have never met any of the of the Beatles. I have seen Ringo Starr with his All Star Band many times, and here in in, in United States as well as Paul McCartney a couple of times. But uh, yeah, hey, hopefully I will. They probably will never give me an interview, but hey, if I can shake hands with the guy who take a picture one day, that that's all I need. And it's... Oh no, he wouldn't get an interview from Ringo. I think someone else I know wanted to wanted to interview him, but no, he doesn't. He doesn't really do that. I think he'd he'd do an interview on uh, mainstream American TV or something, you know. But or, uh, the BBC or something. But, but he, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ringo's 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 the best, and uh, all of us drummers love him. Absolutely, good for you. And let's talk a little bit about Steve Harley. How you 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 mentioned that a little bit. How you ended up meeting him, and uh, how did the the Cockney Rebel begin? Let's go back to the beginning. Ah, oh, that was another really strange encounter because uh, it was just put by pure chance that I I was I I was introduced to him instead of this other bass player who went into oblivion, didn't ever make a success of it. Um, but Steve. It, He'd already um, he'd already been working as a busker. He was like busking, you know, in uh, the tube stations and that's right. Yeah, outside the tube station. They, they... Yeah, he was he was busking with uh, John Crocker, the violinist. They were sort of like playing together, and it was just those two at that stage. And they came round to my mum and dad's house, into my bedroom, and we just listened to some music, chatted, and I think John Crocker asked me what star sign I was, and. Um, Within about an hour, they said, okay, you're in the band. Then they didn't hear me play. They didn't do any rehearsals or auditions or anything. They just liked me and uh, hoped for the best. Um, so wow. that all worked out. It worked out well. Yeah, it worked out well. Um, and, of course, you know, we, 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 we made our first album, The Human Menagerie, which um, I didn't really think much of it at the time. You know, I, I just thought we were, we were a bit ragged and not, not that good. And, uh, but when I listen to it now... I listen to it, um, you know, objectively now rather than subjectively as I did then. And it's actually it's actually my favourite album now because um, mainly because of of well, Steve's vocal performance is. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with that album, but his vocal performance is just off the scale. I mean, it's in, in theatrics, you know, um, mm. and and the band were a, a hot little passionate sort of energetic band as well. Um, and I like that. And, you know, I like to hear young musicians passionate. They don't have a lot of technique, but they don't have a lot of um, uh, tuition or whatever. But they just they just love making music and you can hear the passion. And that's what we were like. And I, I feel that now from what we were like then. And I, in some ways, I sort of I'm kind of listening to what I played on those records. And I'm sort of not so much impressed with myself, but I'm thinking, oh, that little thing that I did there. I don't do that anymore. It's really good. I like that. You know, I'm going to start doing that again, you know? So I kind of learned from myself as a, you know, an older person looking at myself as when I was younger. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. It's like another thing, you know, um, I used to have these two little tiny drums, concert toms, like six inch and 10 inch, eight inch and 10 inch um, for many years. And I stopped using them about 30 years ago. And then when I heard one of the recordings I did with Steve, which has got the full range of those little little drums and big drums, I thought, oh, I really like that. So I've got I've got another set now. They're, they're in my studio now. So I'm 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 getting back into you know it's like that's, learning that's from you're sort of learning and uh, being influenced by myself, which is really weird. Um, so yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I'm glad that you were able to listen to your old old stuff as well because many musicians that I have talked to they never do this. They know I did that album with whatever peter frampton and it's you know that was 30 years ago my my style is different i play different guitar or, or drums or piano whatever you you're playing and uh but you, in your case you you look back and you listen to your own stuff all stuff and, I, well no no i don't i don't listen to oh, no. I, I generally don't listen to my stuff but um, yes. i have been just recently going back uh because i've had more yeah. time you know more time not not actually playing music um it just is a well i had to i had to listen back to that album a little while back because we had to perform some of the songs again so i'd listen to them again okay. um, and and i realized you know that, that um 
how good an engineer Jeff Emmerich was, for instance. You know, he, he engineered that first album and I, I, you know, it's one of the best drum sounds that I think I've ever, ever gotten, you know, just, just an old fashioned drum sound a la, you know, Ringo or whatever. It's fat, tight, punchy, great sound. Um, so yeah, I, I don't generally, if, I, if, I, if I've just done an album with somebody, I don't like to listen to it straight away, um, but it's good to come back to, to listening to things. It's only if they're really good songs. If it's a great song, um, you have to listen to it again because it's, it, 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 it's, you know, when I play on a great song, it inspires me to be better than, you know, better than I am really. Um, so it's nice to listen to yourself doing something that fits a great song. And does it justice? So um, I listen a little bit back, but n not not much. Yeah. Good for you, man. Good for you. How do you think uh, Alan Parsons influenced the band? I mean, he produced a huge, you know, hit. Uh, best year well, of Rebel. Your life. We had the number one hit, "Make Me Smile." And unbelievable, the, you know. Do you mean uh, Alan's influence on um, on Courtney Rebel? Yeah. Yeah. Alan was um, Alan was great to work with. Uh, he's a bit like George Martin, you know. That they're, they're they're very mild, very quiet, um, but they know they make they make good suggestions. Um, you know, if if something isn't quite working, they'll just suggest gently to sort of do it a slightly different way, a bit faster, a bit slower. Um, Uh, and he's a good engineer, of course. You know, he used to get a lovely, a lovely sound when we came back into the studio. You hear this sound, you think, "Oh, that's good." It sound, almost sounds like a record, you know, like a finished mix, you know. Correct. Whereas a lot, a lot of sessions, they, they don't do that. They just sort of do it flat and dry, and, and then they make it all sparkle after, you know. Yeah. Um, but in those days, they had to mainly get a sound and put it onto tape. But Alan went even further with all the lovely reverbs and. It'd make you sound sort of smooth and, and uh, expensive, you know. So he was good in that respect. Um, in fact, when I listen to the, the remastered version of Make Me Smile Now, it's just, oh, the, the sound quality. I'd never listened to um, our old music in my studio, which I've got really good monitors and great headphones and everything. I used to just listen to it uh, like in the living room, you know, on, on a, 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 a medium to low sort of grade hi-fi but in the studio i'm listening to it, i think wow that's fabulous fabulous beautiful mix and everything so he was yeah he was good in that respect it's unbelievable that i mean from you know i'm not a musician right so i don't know how to play any instrument i don't know how to read music but i've been listening to music i don't know three hours a day from the last 50 years or so and uh alan parson it's one of those people that are Amazing. Even if he hasn't formed Alan Parson project or singing or just the recording engineer aspect of himself, it would have lived forever. I mean, it's an amazing that people can can be so good. You know, it's well. The good the good thing about Alan was he he has a he has a very um, I suppose it's it's sort of etched in time. I suppose it, it kind of comes from the '60s. You know, where the focus was always the vocal is the main focus. That's, yeah. that's got to be, it's got to be clear and crystal clear up front. And then the, the main instruments are kind of sort of a level below that. And the drums would be below that. You know, they don't have to be like now you get the drums, it's like, and then the vocal. Yeah. Whereas Alan's balance was always lovely. And he always got a beautiful um, sound from the bass drum. It was nice round sort of nice Ooh. thump, like a big heartbeat, you know, whereas now they can be, Splat, you know. Um, so I like the way he balances the music, and it always brings out the best in everyone's performance. I mean, if you listen to um, uh, one of the most lovely albums, one of the loveliest albums I ever played on was um, Year of the Cat, Al Stewart. Of course. Of course, and you yeah. listen to just the sound quality, and it's just like it's just like smooth and like velvet, you know. It's just beautiful, um, mm. uh, and the musicianship that's brought out because of that approach. It just comes up a notch because we're all inspired yeah. by what we what we hear back, you know. So yeah, Al Alan was fantastic to work with in that respect. Yeah. Alan, Alan is very. I have met him a couple of times, and uh, he's quite quiet. He's not very talkative, but he's very good at what he does. I mean, we'll tell you, you know, like you say, you know, yes, good, no, change this a little bit. Okay, next song, and uh, 
no need to do another, you know, ten tracks or the same version if if it sounds good. That's and, right. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he, very he, efficient in what he does. You know, he knows how to he knows how to listen. He knows how to listen and yeah. what to listen for. You know, and uh, whereas us musicians will sort of listen to ourselves when we record, and we we'll say, "Oh no, I'm not sure. Can I do it again?" And he'll say, "No, it's fine. It's good. It's good." Yeah. And then you go away and come back a few years later and you listen to it and you can't remember what you didn't like, but you can't find what you didn't like, you know. So, That's right. It, it, it yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then uh, after that, well, in between you, you end up becoming a, a your career turned a little bit to the session player and uh, and feel free. And then you end up playing with Al Sewer for the famous, famous Year of the Cat album, you know how. And time is flight, yeah, and time, yeah. and not time is flight. Um, time passages. passages. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, my career, my my sessions career, sort of overlapped. Cockney Rebel. I did because yeah. um, Year of the Cat was. We I think we recorded it seventy five, and it was released seventy six. I think, uh, and I was still in Cockney Rebel at that time. Uh, <laughs> I think the first the first real session that I did when we split up in seventy seven was the Kick Inside with Kate Bush. <laughs> That was the first major album that I recorded after Cockney Rebel split up, and then just, that that's where that's where my session career started to sort of take off a bit. You like doing that? I mean, you you prefer to, or perhaps you don't have any choice, playing with a particular band and then tour with a band, do another record, play with a band, do another record tour, or or it, you prefer to? Is is it fun to be a, a session player or? Difficult or um well it's it's all those it's, it's fun and it's difficult and sometimes it's a hell. <laughs> yeah, but you got you they may hire you to do a specific thing for a specific record and you don't like the you know the producer, you you might not like the musician to begin with, but they give you good money to go and you know bite the bullet, so to speak, and play with them. That's exactly right. I go, I go home, you know, forget That's exactly that. right. Yeah. I mean I think if I if I if I look back on everything I ever did in the studio, um I can only think of about four or five albums that were just unforgettable, you know, just such yeah. an experience and such a magical um chemistry between everybody. Um there's such a rare thing to happen. Um you know, for the for the rest of for the rest of the projects I did, they'd be kind of okay, um, but then there was a few, there was a few, an, another sort of large handful that would have been. I wish they'd never happened, you know, because they, when you get, you know, it's a strange thing, you know, because the happiest time for um, any creative person is when they do it just because they love it and they do it for the love, um, but as soon as it, it has to be, you do it for money. Ooh. And then once you get once you agree a, a fee for something, you have to do it, even though you don't like it. Yeah. It's sort of kind of ruins things a little bit, but uh, you kind of have to do it, really. Yeah, sometimes you close and quite sure you close your eyes, do it in the studio and say, "What the heck I'm doing here, man?" I well, yeah, there were a few cases. There were a few times. There were I'm, getting a few pay, times. I'm getting pay, okay, but I prefer to do something else. <laughs> there were a few times when I got home and I just sort of collapsed on the bed and thought, um, I've had enough of this. I'm not doing this anymore. But I must yeah. have done that about a thousand times in the last 40 years. But uh, there's always something that keeps me going. Um, even, you know, even like just before that, I got that phone call, just before this uh, our interview. Yeah. I was bashing my drums, having a great time, you know, and I do it every day. I play my drums every day. So there's something in me that won't give up, you know, so I have to just keep going and going and going good for you man feel free to elaborate about you know the you know the year of the cat album play with al stewart uh and then time passages i mean both were produced by alan parson again and feel free to right. recall what you remember about i mean i believe i remember i was living in in south america listening to the the year of the cat and now i'm talking to you the you know the drummer for all this I'm, I'm amazing man i'm you you don't know how happy I am talking to you, man. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. What do you recall about the session and playing with Old Stewart and um, what do I recall? I just recall it being like one of those albums, you know, where I said where the where the chemistry between yeah. 
the band, all the musicians and the producer, it was just, it was perfect from the word go. I think, I, you know, I was very young and I was very confident at that time. Um, I didn't have, um, I, I developed a sort of, um, uh, not so much a fear, but more of a critic, being critical of my own playing over the years as the more I, the more sessions that I did. But when I, when I did um, Year of the Cat, I was, I was just, I had a lot of freedom in my playing and because uh, I was in Cockney Rebel, which was a very free experience, you know, very free band. Um, and of course, being in, in the, in the seventies, there was no click tracks, there was no machines. So that the, you know, it was, it was something that you could put in a performance without worrying about whether you're in with a yeah. click. Um, which sort of kind of ruined things for me for many years when they first started throwing clicks at me um, because the best tracks I ever played on were done live, you know, with no, no machines, no, no, no clicks. Um, and when I listen to those grooves, they are just smoother and make you feel um, more like you want to move than all the rigid things that I did later with click tracks Um so yeah, so the the, uh, the year of the cat. I think the first track we did, and I found this out actually just a couple of weeks ago. I, I uh, Al, Al Stewart was in was in London doing some shows with you know he's got this new band, The Empty Pockets. All right, yeah. Um, they invited me down to um, to come to see the show and to come and come up and play. You know, and uh, when Al asks me to, so I came to the show and um, and Al sort of. For the last number, I'll say Stuart Elliott in the room, and then I stand up and went on the stage, and we played Year of the Cat together. Um, and it was uh, Peter White was there as well, you know, the guy that um, was on the Year of the Cat album, um, the guy that co-wrote Time Passages with with Al. Um, he was there, and he, he was telling his little stories, and uh, they played um, Flying Sorcery, you know that track. Mm -hmm. And he said this was the first track we recorded at Abbey Road Studio 2 back in 1975 or 76. Yeah. So that that was the first track I ever played on. And that's one of my favorite tracks I ever played on. Yeah. It's just something about it. There's just something magical about it that um, that the way the band just came together on that first day. And it was like from there on, it was just it just just it was plain sailing, you know. The first track was down and it sounded great and way hey, we're all we're all ready to go um and i remember um when we finished year of the cat we did uh, one of the one of the days we did the sessions was a bank holiday monday which is about a public holiday uh, for which you get double session fees oh, wow. and i thought oh lovely T twice as much money and then exactly a year later we did one day session on a bank holiday monday to do one more track called, I think it was called Bell Size Park Blues or something, which was not a very good track and it didn't make the album and I'm glad it didn't, but it, it, it's, it became a, a bonus track for other things. Um, but that was supposed to be the culmination of Year of the Cat, but Year of the Cat had already been finished, so they just left it as it was. Um, but it, no, it was... It was pure magic playing that al playing on that album. I have to say, um, I don't remember any specific things or, or things that anyone said or did it. It's I just I guess I have pictures now, like pictures of that room and where I was sitting and wow. where and Al and Pete with their acoustic guitars in a booth, you know, so we didn't spill the drums onto them. Um, and and the thing the thing about it was that there were such good musicians. Um, and I, I don't think I'd played with so many good musicians at one time. Wow. It was just, you know, Tim Rennick, you know, the guitarist. My God, I mean, you, you listen to the guitar on Year of the Cat and it's, Amazing, it's just out yeah. there. Oh, it's out there. It's just like, you know, he was way ahead of, I, I, I was like a caveman compared to him. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but sometimes, you know, but, but it, it's Al's manager told me that um, it was me that made the album. It was he thought it was me, it was my drumming that made the album, but I, I wouldn't say that. I think it was a, it was a culmination of everybody just doing the right thing at the right time um, and excelling uh, uh, on what was really beautifully written, fantastic songs. Yeah, there, there isn't a bad song on that album. They're, they're just they're all fantastic. 
I'm fantastic. I'm happy that you guys, in the case of Alan Stewart, you know, still get along well. There's some band that you play or they break up, they don't want to see one another. It's great that you, you know, with some with some musicians, right, you can still be friends, get along, you know. You know yeah. You move on in your life, but still call you back and you still have, you know, another 10 minutes of fame, if you will, playing in the band with the, the guy you recorded, you know, for 50 years ago, or whatever. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's lovely. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long may it last. It's 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 a beautiful thing, man. Um, and then uh, tell me now how you end up, you know, meeting Kate Bush to to begin with, and uh, never mind playing with her. And but uh, feel free to elaborate on how you end up getting into the album, the kick inside, and so on. So so. Right. Okay. Uh, I think I might have said something about that earlier. Um, you know, I said that on the first two Courtney Rebel albums, Andrew Powell, Andrew Powell, Powell yeah, orchestral yeah. arranger, played on yeah. on the suit, and um, it was Andrew that produced those first two albums of Kate's. He yeah. produced. He, he was a producer, so he asked me to to do the sessions. So that's how I got. That's how I got the 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 the, the this the uh, the gig with Kate. Yeah. It was Andrew Powell. Yeah, she she's an amazing lady. I mean, I I look back in her career. It's like the Alan Parson of the music industry, in my opinion. I, every record was so different, and it was way ahead of the time. Yeah, she she really know what she wanted to do, and you were not in all the track in every album. Sometimes she would use in you know in a studio like 10, 15 people and. I want you to play this track and that track, and you think that some people can have a vision. It's, I don't know. I think you you are born with it or you are not. I mean, it's amazing how unbelievable, you know, she is or was, you know. So well, when we actually when we went into the studio, she had already written all of her songs, and so really? and she and yes, they're all written. They're they're, they're all that she'd written them years before. Um, in fact, she when she she's, I think she wrote most of the songs when she was sixteen, and we recorded them when she was nineteen. Correct. Yeah. I think Wuthering Heights. She may have written that closer to when we did the sessions, but um, she played them on the piano. She'd sit at the grand piano and she would play the song and sing the song. So all we had to do was just listen to the song, look at the chord chart, clock what she was singing, and just play along. I mean, that's it was so easy. It's a bit like you know Elton John. He does, it is a full performance on the piano and the vocal. It, it, it's um, all you have to do is listen Ooh. and respond. Um, it's not like it didn't start off and then she sang it later. She sang it live in the studio with us. Amazing, man. How, it was fantastic. How, how old were you at the time when you were playing the gig inside when you recorded? Uh, I think I was 24. She was 19, and I'm about five years older than her, I think. My God, young, young guy, man. <laughs> Play with yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I was, yeah, I was, um, uh, it was a magic time, actually, it was a magic time, I felt a magical air about, that was one of the albums, you know, I said there was only about four or five albums that were magical, that was one yeah. of them, uh, Year of the Cat was another, Lenny Zakatek's album was one. Which one? You know, one was the Do It Right and uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. the A and M. That 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 was a that was a magic experience with some fantastic yeah. musicians and Lenny's yeah. amazing vocal. Um, there are others. Pyramid, uh, Alan Parsons' yeah, Pyramid. Parsons, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think my first album with Cotney Rebel, that was just because we were young and excited, and we just played. We just went in and played the songs. We we'd been we'd been rehearsing them and playing them on live for for months. So we just all we did was play them. And that was it. Can I just go and get a glass of water? Of course, yeah. We'll post it, post it. And uh, so the, the first album, of course, uh, The Kick Inside did very well. At the time, you knew that you will be... She, wa she was in tour at the time, but you knew that you will come back and play with the third and second and fourth and fifth album with her. I mean, the chemistry no. was great, or, or, you, or you went home and say, man, that was a great evening. She's a young, nice lady with a beautiful voice, but hey, make, nothing may happen. On... I've well, um, I never really make those kind of judgments 
well, I never made any of those kind of judgments when I sort of recorded with anybody. Yeah. Um, I'd always just, I'd always assume that that was it. Yeah. Uh, they might not be a hit. They might be a hit. You don't know. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of being asked back, um, I never expected to be asked back. I mean, but Kate did ask me back for about, I think it was eight albums after that. Correct. <laughs> um, Amazing. But she did use other drummers. I mean, she didn't ask me back automatically as a first choice every time. Um, yeah. Sometimes it was. And she, she just had, I think Kate, the thing about Kate is she's very, um, I don't know if mercurial is the right word, but she, she's always, she's always changing. There's, She's not a static, you know. Oh, I've got a drummer, or I've got this. She's got a whole, she's got a whole um, team of people that she's worked with over the years that she sort of cherry picks them for this and for that. And you never know what you're going to be asked to do. Um, I'm just thank my lucky stars that I got to play on the ones that I did get to play on. You know, like the um, Wuthering Heights, um, Babushka, Breathing. Um, and there's a bunch of album tracks as well, but it was really, really an honor to be part of really great songs that were hit singles as well. It's, it's luck of the draw, you know, you, you don't know which track you're going to be asked to do. Correct. The, 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 the key Bush music is in many ways from, not from a drummer point of view, from my point of view, right? And um, they are very complex, very difficult to be a, a musician playing those. So now for you, for your point of view as a drummer, they are in many ways atypical in their structure. You know, how you define the, the drum arrangement? Uh, and, um, and... Well, it was kind of easy. It was easy in the the first two albums because we played live. Yeah. Um, it got more difficult as when Kate became the producer and she pre-recorded her parts and her vocals and then she would get one person at a time to come in and play on them. Um, then it was a question of, her, her listening to you while you're playing rather than listening to herself and performing. She's more sort of microscopic about what you're playing or what I was playing. Um, so that kind of slowed the process down a bit. Um, and it kind of gave birth to a different kind of music, uh, a kind of music that doesn't, it doesn't um, organically evolve because once something is on tape, that's it, you know, that you have to play to that, you know, whereas if it's a live person, they will, you know, it's like sand going through a glass, it sort of falls its way, then it find they find their way through, you know, and that's how, that's how it's like a band of musicians is, they, they make little tiny adjustments here, there and everywhere without knowing it. And then all of a sudden you listen to a take and you think, oh, that's, that's a fantastic take, but that, that one earlier was not very good, you know. Mm. Um, and it's about listening, but w when you're playing to a track that is set, it's it's kind of more rigid because then there will be click tracks and pulses to play to, or um, or lin drums or fair light patterns and things, which makes it more machine like. Um, so in a lot of ways, I actually uh, I, I preferred making the light the first two albums, which were live, because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. more it's more organic and it's it's. Uh, it's freer, you know, you have more freedom. You can, you can pull and push and just sort of, it's more fluid, you know? Um, I can't remember what point I was going to make. I said, well, what was the original question? I forgot now. No, no, no. You know, the, the, the drum arrangement and their, that you bring into a song, they, they were very complex. And I say to you, All right, that, yeah. you know, it's Kate, Kate Bush's um, music in general, right? For now. Um, from a consumer point of view, from my point of view, I listen to a lot of stuff. It's very complex. Never mind for a musician like yourself performing this stuff. I mean, yeah, it is complex. It's um, it's not technically complex. It's just the arrangements are not what you expect. It's right. like if you if someone plays a song, a regular type song, you know, kind of know what's coming next, don't you? Correct. You know, if it's a verse, if it's an intro, you think was well, a verse coming. And then the verse is a certain feeling. You think, oh, I can feel the bridge coming now. There it is. Oh, now, I, yeah, the chorus is just about to hit. There it is. Bang on you. And you always know where it's going to happen. But with right. Kate's music, you can forget about uh, trying to guess what, what's going to happen next because she has this this thing of um, I don't. I, I wouldn't like to say I know exactly how she does it, but I, I would. I would think that she's got this um, thing where she'll play the piano and she'll be sort of 
singing her lyrics and the lyrics sometimes dictate what time signature it is um or, or you know what you know like a given but it's like wuthering heights for instance was uh the chorus was five four two bars of five i think it's it two bars of five four and a bar of two four or three four i can't remember i'd have to i'd have to count it again but that's because of the lyric yeah you know where i had to sort of instead of just playing a, a, a steady offbeat i had to sort of add a beat and then bring it into a different place judged you know by the way i felt whether it was she was on you know on an upbeat or a downbeat but it was the lyrics that made say it's, it's got to be a five four bar otherwise the lyric doesn't work so that's how she that's how she works she'll sing a lyric and she'll you know she'll sing it till it needs to end and whatever the time signature happens to be that's what it is you know whether it's a five or it's a six or it's a seven and then the second time it repeats it'll be a different lyric and then it won't have that time signature change so you've got you've got to listen for um you know where she's going and sometimes you know well not sometimes all the time when she'd already written something i'd have to make some notes you know write some notes down and the time signatures and say well this is a this is this length this is eight bars now it's nine bars and then it's ten bars and it's like it's uh it's not something you can just come and jam on like we did like we did in the first albums which you just play you listen and play right um, yeah it's, it's more more complex more complicated it's amazing that. that that people can first of all talking about jay K. Bush, she she re, she wrote all this unbelievable song when she was like you mentioned 15 16 years old and then after the first two year two records she she became her own producer it's it, it's amazing that people had that ability at that early life she would have been 19 20 or whatever being producer yeah. Of her own music and trusting her instinct, don't hire any people who have been around for a long time at the time in the forties or whatever. Tell her what to do. No, you know, I know what I'm doing. And 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, nobody, I'm... nobody tells Kate what to do. My God, I mean, she is she's one of the gentlest, sort of sweetest people you will ever meet. I mean, she's so so yeah. sweet and, and um, calm and uh, patient. But she's resolved. <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't make a suggestion. I think we did as younger musicians. We try and make suggestions, and she'd smile and just you know just can't get just quietly ignore you. you know? <laughs> so we we learn very fast that you don't you don't you don't nobody tells Kate what, what she do. should be doing. No 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 no. It no. doesn't work that way. No. She, she wouldn't say no. Her. She just look at you. That's it. Or smile. She right. has to. Yeah, she has to do it the way she has to do it. Um, and you can't argue with 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 the outcome because everything she everything she's recorded is just stunning. You know, it's just um, it may it may not be the way that we as musicians would have performed it, but she got what she wanted out of each musician um, right. because of the fact that she was she had a more microscopic view as as the producer. You know, behind the glass, um, she would we would discuss the parts and then she would say what she did like, what she didn't like. Uh, whereas when we did a kick inside and um, and uh, Lionheart, she didn't make any comments about anything. She just played the songs. We played them. Producer said yes or no. Um, so in in that way, I think she was slightly more compliant and manipulated because she was young and just learning. But she learned real fast. I have to say, she learned so quickly that she was. Uh, I think she'd had it planned what was how, how it was going to develop. You know. She would she would see what's going on, um, and then drop the producer, and then she co-produced the third album with John Kelly, who was our engineer. So she got a more of a feel for the production by using him as a co-producer. So they so split it two two you know two producers, and then after that she did it solo because she she'd learned enough from those three experiences that she could do it herself. And she even went further than that. She she um, set up her own studio, which not many people did in those days. She bought all the gear, bought the desk, bought the multi-track tape machines. And she set up a lovely little studio at her dad's, mum and dad's house, which was a farm, farmhouse. Correct, yeah. And it had a big barn and she, she converted this barn to a beautiful little studio. And she made Hounds of Love there. 
Oh my God! What are, yeah, I never, I have never seen Kate Bush playing live. Of course, never had met her. Probably will never have the opportunity to interview her. But it's someone that I really, really admire. And uh, yeah, she's an amazing. Person. What do you recall yeah. about running, running up the hill? What do I recall? Yeah. Or um, well, I remember she sent me, uh, which is very rare for Kate to do. Well, if she never did it ever, she sent me a cassette. Oh, really? Of, um, yeah. of of the starting point, which yeah. was a drum machine. It was a drum machine. Um, and the song was there. It was all finished. Um, the song was finished. We you know with some, a little bit of keyboards and some vocals. Um, so I had to I had to come in and replace the drums. And in in sort of attempting to do so. Um, we ended up um, actually keeping the the program toms because of the sound. It, they got so used to that that sound of those toms and the and the incessant sort of drive that um, programmed drums have. They kept that, and I played uh, I played the real drums over the top, um, and then I played the big fills in in the you know the big explosions and the fills in um, the middle, mm. and that was it really. Um, and then uh, I was quite surprised she sent me the cassette because I knew she was very private and very, very suspicious that stuff like that gets out and people bootleg it and sell it and stuff. And she asked, she asked for it back. And I, I said, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. So I gave it back to her. <laughs> so I no longer have that copy. Um, but it was, it was just one, one, one track amongst many on uh, Hounds of Love, which was uh, Ooh, another great, yeah. Which, you know, um, as musicians, you know, I'd do some tracks. Charlie Morgan did some tracks. Um, and we'd be uh, just in the dark as to what the album was going to be. But especially in the, the ninth wave, you know, that side of the album, who would have known that it was going to be such a such an epic piece of um, orchestral and, uh, oh, I don't know, it's just like, a, it's like painting a huge painting, wasn't it? I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable piece of music. You know, transitioning from one track to another as a as a whole sort of theme. Um, yeah, it was an absolute masterpiece. That I, I don't know how the hell she envisaged it, and whether it whether it just came to better, together bit by bit. But I think that it's definitely recognised as her best album, isn't it? Oh yeah, and if you, from a commercial point of view, right, that album and, and that track, um, right up the hill, or. Uh, whether in height or Bagusha or cloud bursting, some of the the ones that I recall are have been streamed millions of times, billions of times all over the world. Like I don't I don't know if you have any you receive any royalties, but Kate Bush is you know uh, with all her rights, very rich person. She you know, yeah to to come back and tour or play or I mean there are you know. I don't know. I don't hit them somewhere. You know, they don't want to play anymore. They don't have to play anymore. If they do, it's because they love the music. It's amazing. That yeah, I think I think Kate in an ideal world, Kate just likes to be quiet and private and record record her music like an artist painting a painting. You know, she doesn't. I don't think she really wants to go out playing live. Um, she did. She did that one time back in two thousand and fourteen. Um, yeah, but. Um, no, it's very unlike her. Um, and uh, everyone kept asking me, you know, when running up that hill became a big hit. They said, yeah. do you think Kate will start to come out and tour now? I says, I'm, I'm pretty sure she won't. <laughs> she's not like it. She's not an opportunity. Uh, uh, sorry, an opportunist like that. She would just she'll do things when when there's a, a good reason to do it or she wants to do it, but not out of opportunism. She won't, uh, doesn't go for that. Yeah, I as I say before, I I never seen her, and I think uh, the the show that you re referred to, I think it was um, I don't know ten to fifteen nine. The ticket went like that, and then she disappeared again. It's uh, you know. It's, yeah, it's, I couldn't I I couldn't get a ticket initially because I I'd sort of lost contact with Kate at that point. Yeah. Um, but her um her ex boyfriend and bass player and engineer Del Palmer. I yeah. still had his number, so I, I I asked him if if you know if 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 he knew where I could get some tickets, and so he asked Kate, and she got me two tickets, and I got in to yeah. see the show. So yeah, so I got in just just scraped my way in. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, shortly after, you end up replacing Stuart Tosh in the Alan Parsons project. 
you know, how, how tell us about how you end up joining the band and from Pyramid and so forth. Ah, uh, yeah, that was um, that was an that was as a result of having um, played the kick inside. Mm -hmm. Those sessions, those sessions, is where I met Ian Benson and David yeah. Payton from Pilot. Yeah, they were they were in Kate Kate's band then. Um, not not sorry, not in her band. We were on the sessions, um, and when we'd finished that album, they um, they told me that. Um, they really it's the first time we played and actually no i played with ian many years ago but it was the first time we played an album together as as musicians and um they both really liked my playing and they said oh alan's uh, stuart stuart's leaving the band uh, stuart's leaving the sorry he's not leaving he's joining 10 cc and he won't be able to do the project anymore. So we'll put a word in for you. We'll ask Alan if he can just use you. And I knew Alan anyway, so that was a done deal. I just said, oh, yeah, okay, in you come. So that that started that off. And um, the first album we did there was Pyramid. Well, they, they, Dave uh, Peter told me also that you guys get along very well. They were a very tight crew and uh, good good uh, chemistry. Oh, great yeah. A lot of you. And uh, it was great. Sometimes... You don't see that in bands, you know. You, you but in your in that particular period of your time, uh, David Payton told me that you guys get on very well. There was easy going, very professional, but they it was good good chemistry about all of you, you know. Oh yeah, we used to have a laugh as well because um, Ian and David are are, are both Scottish. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. they were very close. They were very close. It was always just the two of them that were going everywhere together, you know. And I, I used to sort of, I used to tag along. I, I always felt like they're a bit like the odd man out because they were doing all their Scottish accents and their silly jokes and everything. So I started doing the same thing. So we, we all became Scottish overnight, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, what a laugh though! Such, I mean, fantastic musicians. I mean, David is one of the one of the best bass players I ever played with. Well, yeah. he, he's the only one. Um, who I could um, safely say was played bass more like Paul McCartney. Really? Yeah. You know, yeah. like that um, melodic sort of a lot of playing up the top of the scale and high up and then down and then just melodic, you know, he's like, because he's a songwriter as well. Um, I used to love his playing. Beautiful, cool. beautiful, beautiful bass playing. How was uh, Eric Wolfson to, to be with and follow direction from him or interaction with him? Oh, Eric, I never, Eric. I never met him, and uh, of course, I know who he is. And... Oh, Eric was well. We, we, we really liked Eric. He was, he was fun. But no, no, he wasn't fun. But we used to make fun of him because um, he was very serious. He was very serious. He was very tall. He was about six foot six. Wow. Um, and he spoke to us as if he was like our headmaster. Really? Yeah. He, he, he always called me Elliot, Elliot, or Benson, or Peyton. You know, it was our surnames. You know, our last name. Really, no way, personally. Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, very, very, very sort of, um, very serious. But he could have a laugh as well. It was, it was, a, it was a really interesting character, actually. Um, and of course, a, a an incredible, incredible songwriter. Um, but yeah, we used to have fun. We used to have fun. We we used to take the Mickey out of him, and uh, and but he wouldn't smile. You know, because it was always very, very, very serious looking. But it was all in good spirits. There was no, there was no, uh, there was no cynicism or nastiness. But um, he, he, he was a great, he was a great uh, part of the team. In fact, a very important part of the team because he wrote so, so many of the songs. But um, yeah, yeah he, he was, he was a good character. Yeah, I'm surprised that you know when when Alan Parson began doing, you know, keep took the head of the producer and began writing song and then touring and doing doing the project that the band wasn't called I don't know Alan Parson and and uh, and himself. I mean Alan Parson with with Walson or, or you know Walson Parson project or whatever. I mean in, I don't know. I think maybe Alan Parson was more well known at the time or when they asked him what what's the name of of the band's going to be, and other person say, "Well, other person, I'm, that's my first and last name." But I'm surprised, um, that, you know, the Wilson name, last name didn't come along with with them. Well, no, I I think it was Eric's Eric's idea to call it the Alan Parsons Project. Really? Um, but yeah, because he he he. he 
I think Eric regarded himself as a, as a writer, but um, a creator, but maybe not as as an artist or performer um, and a manager. He was a manager as well. Um, but it was also the fact that um, uh, Alan had was making a name as a, as a hit producer. Uh, and he also um, engineered and mixed Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. So that's I think that's what Eric wanted for his music. He wanted that that status and the pedigree of Alan producing and engineering his music. So he gave it Alan's name. Um, but I will say that he did regret doing that. You know, he was um, if you look if you um, if you listen to the song Limelight from this thing was it from Stereotomy or Gaudi? I can't remember, but. Um, that's it. poor old Eric. <laughs> so, that's all he ever wanted was the limelight from uh, since it all began, because um, he didn't really get the record. I don't think because it was called the Alan Parsons Project. Alan was obviously getting all the attention on interviews and everything, and I think he realised that he perhaps made a bit of a mistake for himself. But um, it, you know, it's all water on the bridge. You know, can't can't change history. Um, and they were both very successful as a result of it. So. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a, yeah. What you recall about the one of my favorite track in in the lap of the gods, if you can uh, if you can recall anything about that track or that I'm album, just, I'm just trying to recall it. I can't think of anything memorable that you can. Lap of the gods, isn't that isn't that an instrumental? Correct. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place, man. I I'm can't I can't um You're blind, yeah, yeah. Can you play it? Um <laughs> uh, I will need to look it up in Spotify and but, but um, no, let me no, like, no, hold no. on, let me just let me find it on uh, if you have it, if you can recall that would be I'll find I'll find it on YouTube, hold on. Yeah. I just I just need to remember exactly what the track is. Yeah. In the lap. Yeah, in the lap of the gods. Well, there's a few tracks called that. In the lap of the cops, Koba, Alan Parson, probably you will find it. Yeah, there we go. I thought we'd get an advert now, but uh, never mind. Oh, there it is. Uh, the lap of the gods. Just wait for this ad to pass. That's right. <laughs> there we go. Someone's died. No, no, hang on. Oh, dead it. Yeah, dead it. There's no drums. <laughs> no, but it's a beautiful piece, man. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, it's, uh, Alan was so good at writing instrumentals. I have to say, people think it's it's easy. I always there's no lyrics, don't have to think of any lyrics. But um, his his uh, instrumentals were always spot on. I mean, seriously, I think Sirius is the most in, um, successful track of, of of all because it got used for the Chicago Bulls. So it's the it was only a little short piece, but it's, it was uh, really, really, really successful. Yeah, that, that track, like you mentioned. Puff Daddy used it as well. He sampled it. That's right. It, but he had been used with the Chicago Bulls, commercials, malls, supermarkets, elevators, everywhere, man. It's, uh, like, yeah, you know, I know. I know. I know. It was like a, one of the Kate Bush's, you know, track that going to be played forever you know so it's yeah what's the, what was the role of andrew powell in the band at the time you remember you have any recollection of orchestra yeah orchestra orchestral arranger yeah but but who who is supervising it's was alan parson supervising the word that andrew or they're complementary i mean eric was writing a lot of the lyrics at the time and, and so forth. Well, what they would do, what they would do is yeah. that Eric would write a song 
Yeah. Um, then um, Alan would come into the studio with us. We'd record it. Correct. And then Andrew would write, uh, um, once he'd hear the song, he'd write all the orchestra parts. I see. And then record that later at a later date. Yeah. So that went after. So I, I don't really know what, what, how much freedom they gave him i would say they probably gave him complete freedom and said and, and maybe just say well we want nothing here and then you want to come in there and then later on we want it to come down again um as a general dynamic you know but um i think uh, you know when i when i listen back to it what you hear on the albums is what i know is generally what um andrew powell does he just gives a big orchestra it's always a big orchestra he doesn't do small orchestras <laughs> big orchestras with symphony orchestras with lots of percussion and twice as many of everything that everyone else has you know but it's big it's big or big symphonic sound so um he, he probably would have because uh, once he's written the parts and they're in the studio it's very difficult to start rewriting stuff with like a hundred musicians in in the room so i, I, I think he, i think he probably had a free reign wow yeah it's good that he was allowed to do that because that's, you know, bringing a hundred people or doing that many orchestral arrangement is, is very expensive. Yeah. Know? Well, he did the same. He did the same on, um, year of the cat. He, he, he yes, did all the orchestra orchestras on that. Um, no, he was, he was a name. He was a big name then and, uh, doing lots of, lots of sessions. So uh, I, I don't know what how their relationship came together, him and Alan. I really don't. But um, they were all part of the same family that I was talking talking earlier. You know, he was part of the family. Alan was part of the family. The yeah. boys in Pilot were part of the family. Yeah. And um, the rest right. is history, yeah. Right. In 84, you participated in an excellent band called Kids with, with you know, uh, some, you know, famous Kibberdys, uh, Kibberdys, from Camel, Peter Bardens. What do you yeah. recall? Uh, Pete, uh, Camel, one of my favorite time of all time. So, um, you know, it's amazing that all you guys, yeah. are, you know, known and play with one another and like one another. And like you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, it's amazing. What yeah, you, yeah, it, it was good. Um, that was another one of Eric's um, brainchilds. He, he, he put us together and got the deal, record deal with the EMI, I think it was, um, publishing and everything got the advances and um but it was nice it was a nice album very very smooth we were trying we were, i think we were trying to be an 80s rock band but um it sort of it was a bit smoother than that more like what they'd call yacht rock now i suppose yep. um, but you know it, it was there was some good stuff on there um but it was all it was all songs that were written by the band uh, different members of the band i wrote i wrote a couple of songs Ian Benson wrote a few songs. David Payton wrote one or two. Pete Bardens wrote a few as well. Um, Colin, I actually, I actually, my songs were co-written with Colin Blunston. We, we, we wrote together at that time. Um, but I think we didn't, re what we really didn't have was a was a, a song that was good enough to be a hit single. Um, it was a nice album, but uh, there were no real hit singles on there. Um, the one that we tried to sort of, get a hit single with um which was a Pete Barden song just didn't didn't make it um so we uh, we, we uh we got a re-signing uh EMI re-signed us for a second album but then they dropped us so we didn't get to do the album but we got the money but <laughs> so we got we got an advance and they said keep the money but we don't want the album so uh we got dropped yeah but it's, um, uh, I think I think actually uh, the 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 Keats album is is as we speak it's coming out on vinyl with Renaissance Records. Oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty good. Is it yeah. mixed feeling about yeah? On on one hand, you got an investment, you got the money, but a second album was never created because this record label thought, well, th this guy didn't have a single one. You know, we're not going to make any money out of you. So go away and here's the money. It's... Yeah, I guess they could have made us record another album, but then I guess they didn't want to promote it and market it because that's, you know, that costs a lot more money on top. Um, they just probably felt that we were not, because we we're very much a studio thing. I mean, we weren't going out and playing live. So 
that kind of helps if, if you're a proper band. We weren't really a, a real band. It was more of a sort of, um, it was put together by Eric Wolfson, really. <laughs> so we were all thrown together in a room by Eric Wolfson. Um, and we made some nice music. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was a oh, nice yeah. album. It was a nice album. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe lyrically it was, it was a little bit confusing. I remember Pete Barton's um, <laughs> saying at one stage, he wrote a song called Fight to Win, which is like, you know, in the 80s, the songs were always optimistic and positive, you know. And then, uh, and then Ian Benson wrote a song called "Give It Up," <laughs> you know, which is like "Give It Up." You know? yeah. And, and I remember, I, I've never, I never forget Pete Barnes. He was a really funny guy, actually. He says, he says this album's got no no direction. You know, I'm I'm writing this song called "Fight to Win," and then he had writes a song called "Give It Up." You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah Peter Bar Peter Barton passed away, right? He's no, no I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about. <sighs> Oh, maybe getting on for ten years ago, but maybe eight years ago, died. Yeah, yeah. He, he was an amazing musician. Too. I mean, he was good. He he was he's probably. I think he was the main writer. He was the main songwriter that Eric Wilson put us together with. Yeah, yeah. I liked I liked Pete. He was he was um. He was a good uh, good laugh. We had a good laugh together. Yeah, yeah. Have you have you ever thought about writing a book or like? A autobiography of all the i don't know if you have one or not but i haven't actually no no i haven't i think um, maybe it's you then hire somebody to do it for you i suppose there is enough material there it's just remembering oh, yeah the problem. Um, of course you have yeah yeah sort of uh, take all my interviews and write that down <laughs> yeah hire somebody what do you recall about uh no more lonely night with paul mccartney oh wow that was amazing my God, what an opportunity that was. And the funny thing is that I got asked to do that by um, an agent. Really? It's the weirdest thing, because, you know, uh, Paul was doing, making the film. It, it was a, the movie, uh, Give My Regards to Broad Street. Yeah. And again, you know, like I said, I, I'm really, I real, feel, feel really blessed by doing, you know, playing on, on the best songs and the, and the hit singles. And that was the hit single from the album. I think that there wasn't another one. That that was it. And I just happened to get this session out of the blue. Um, and the guy, with um, the agent that called me, was they're called a, they were called fixers. They fix sessions. He said, oh, um, Stuart, how, are you available on whenever the day was, you know, and, uh, to do a session at Air London Studios? I said, yeah, 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 no problem. Who's it for? He said, Paul McCartney. I said, my God, yeah, am I, I'm, am I available? You know, that's what a question. So um, and again, I received a cassette. I received a, I received a cassette of him singing it around the piano with George Martin, which I've still got. I've still got that cassette. Um, and on the B side, it was it was a version of it with with Paul playing drums as a demonstration of what he wanted yeah. from me. Um, yeah. And we came in, recorded it, and Herbie Flowers was on on bass. And Dudley was on keyboards, you know, from the Art of Noise. Um, can't remember who else was on it, but it was um, oh, it was, it was it was electrifying, just being part of it. I, I remember, I remember three weeks after that, I was just walking around like on air, you know, like really? I was just I, I was just walk, floating around, just couldn't believe that I just played with Paul McCartney. It was is it was unbelievable. And then to get Ringo on onto my CV as well later on was like, oh yeah. If only I could have got the other the other two, that would have been fantastic. Yeah. But I'm glad that you you still have the tape. Don't 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 sell it. Keep it for your kids or something. My, that tape might be worth a lot of money, you know. So, I'll have to uh, I'll have to digitize it because I've got still got a cassette machine, but I, I would really, I really should uh, run it through my computer and, and and capture it in digital before it before yeah. it dies. Yeah. But um, as opposed to the one from Kate Bush that she asked you to give it back. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that that song um, "Running Up That Hill" was originally called "A Deal with God." A deal with God. Right. That was the title, but the record company decided that it was a bit risky to just, yeah, you know, because there'd be a lot of religious people that would be upset and they won't buy it, so. Um, they compromised and they called it running up that hill but then on the album Kate insisted that it was running up that hill brackets a deal with God right, so yeah. she kind of she kind of got her way in the end but um, yeah 
you know, all this religious group will gain against you. Hey, why are you using that kind of lyrics? You know, God is God and this and that. And of course, you know. Yeah, you yeah. I suppose in business, you know, when you're business and marketing, you need to, you do need to be careful. Otherwise, you, that's right. Because you want to sell, you know, you want to sell the product and there's no, yep. no point in upsetting people. Absolutely. When you recall about George Martin on Kenny Roy's album, Heart of the Matter. Oh, man, that was another one. In fact, I've just put that song as one of my num number one top favorite songs that I played on uh, on my. Uh, there's a Facebook sort of, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Co Stuart Elliott Cotney Rebel fan page, yeah. Facebook page. Um, I was asked what my fate, what what songs I was most proud of playing on, and Heart of the Matter is one of them. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh man, I mean, again, you know, I listened to that album. And, and what, what happened was um, George Martin um, invited us over to Paris to record those songs with, with Kenny. And, um, and then he went off to L.A. to do the rest of the album. But when you listen to that album, if you listen to the four songs that we played in Paris, we got the best songs. Heart of the Matter, Tomb of the Unknown, whatever it was, Love. And there was a couple of Morning Desire. And there was another one. Um, but we got the best. We got the best songs and the title track. In fact, I I met the songwriter Michael Smotherman on Facebook. I just saw him on Facebook, and I made a, a Facebook friend of him about three or four years ago. And then a few months later, he died. And I thought, oh, what a shame. But I had to tell him. I just had to contact him and say, you know, that song is one of the most beautiful songs I have ever had the pleasure to play on. Thank thank you for writing it. It's just, oh man, what a what a what an honor it is to play stuff like that. It's, it's, just, it's just sad that people don't get that opportunity anymore to, to well, be in the studio. You're a, you're a lucky guy. I'm giving you more ammunition for you to write your your autobiography. You know, I'm I'm bringing memories back to you, and oh, God, I remember that. I mean, you have enough material yeah. for uh, four hundred pages, man. So maybe was, maybe yeah. one day. You will listen to his interview and say, man, this guy, you know, <laughs> took me year by year after that. Maybe I better listen because there's got to be a lot of... A lot hey, of maybe if, if this interview is long enough, maybe the transcript would make a book. I don't know. Well, I, I, will, I will send you the transcript. I will send you everything. Don't, don't worry. You play with <laughs> another another lady. I think she's Ana Gabriel. I think she's from Mexico. And, uh, uh, you know, you play with uh, famous musicians, from all over the world, not just the English world or the European world. Do you recall anything about Anna Gabriel and how Anna that Gabriel. opportunity come about? Or no, you don't recall? I don't remember that name at all. I remember Anna Belen, but um, Anna Gabriel. Yeah. Or Anna Belen as well. She's 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 well known as well. So um, it was Victor Manuel as as uh, and Anna Belen. Um, I right. think the I, th I think the most um, from Spain. Yeah. I think the I think the most popular and famous one it was. I mean, you are, are you are you from Chile or are you Italian? No, I'm from Chile. I was born in Chile and I came to United States to study after high school. So all right, yes, Claudio, sort of um, Italian name, isn't it? It is Italian name. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, well, our place was some big, big Italian artists. Uh, Claudio Baglioni was one, um, but the most the most um, enigmatic one was um, Lucio Battisti. Yeah. I know the last thing. I don't know. Well, uh, the one song again. I again. I got the pleasure to play on on his most um, famous and most popular song, which is like of the decades in in Italy. Uh, it's, called, it's called "Con il Nastro Rosa" or "Nostra Nostra Rosa." Con il C C O N I L. Yeah. Nostra Rosa. I think it is. Um, now that song, it's just it's one of those songs that becomes a, a big hit for generations and generations. And the, the number of Italian people that have just said, oh, man, that song is just incredible. And it is. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, a beautiful track. Um, and poor old Lucio, he died quite a few years ago of cancer. But um, he was he was a lovely fellow. He was. Um, he was the only Italian or, or, or um, European artist that I ever worked with that could speak English. 
Yeah, the the Italians are very particular. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, none none of the none of the Spanish artists or Italian artists that I ever played with, they none of them spoke English. <laughs> so, <laughs> our producer Jeff Wesley, he had to learn Spanish and Italian in in order to produce them. <laughs> so, so that's dedication, isn't it? How about that? Well, if down the road you end up playing with any musician who from Latin America that um, don't don't that don't speak English, I'm I'm glad to help out. I, I, oh, you know, right, right, right. You have been very good to me, so i uh, to yeah, glad, no. glad, to, glad to help you out with translation. Yeah. Uh, how did the collaboration with the Royal Daltrey came about? Um, I can't remember who, I actually can't remember who called me about that. Um, yeah. Just trying thinking of who was in the band. Um, yeah, I don't actually... Don't you know? I can't remember who called me for, for that session. Or well, sorry, it wasn't a session. It was live. We did, um, did we did. Um, it wasn't even a tour either. What it was, it was one big show in Madison Square Garden, plus uh, about three three shows around the area of New New Jersey yeah. and New York. Yeah. So we just did a few little ones, and then the big one, um, and that was it. We were out in New York for ten days, which was an absolute blast. Um, and what now? What originally happened was, um, you remember the band Big Country? Yep. They were they were going out as his backing band, and they were also supporting his shows. And then somewhere along the line, because they were getting very successful and having hit records, they decided that they just wanted to be themselves and not his backing band. So they pulled out. And then I got a call. It was like an emergency call to come down to um, John Henry's studios in North London um, to rehearse with Roger Daltrey. So we started again from the ground up and um, rehearsed it at three weeks rehearsal, which is very rare. I mean, nobody rehearses that long now, um, but we rehearsed it up and went out and played the shows. And that, that's kind of it, really. Yeah. Well, well, the very you know the who one of the probably it might be one of the best band of all, all time. You work. Oh with yeah, you. no, actually no. I, I must tell you that um, playing well, well, most of the set that we played with him was um, was his solo material from um, Under a Raging Moon, that album, eighties yeah. album. But we also got to play Won't Get Fooled Again and Substitute. Wow. And I tell you, a substitute was another one of those moments where I had shivers up my spine because I remember as a kid, as a kid in the youth club and all the boys and girls dancing to substitute, you know, they put it on. It's just a record player with a big speaker, you know, but in a, like a school, a school hall, you know, and, I, and now I'm in this room and all my friends are dancing to substitute. And there I am sort of 30 years later playing that damn song it's it it it, it really is uh, it defies description how 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 emotional that is absolutely yeah yeah, uh, yeah. as i said to you before it, it happens to me with you and all the other you know people from camel that i have interview or pilot or genesis or, yeah uh, i'm going to be talking to uh, one of the pink floyd guys and Led Zeppelin guy down the road and it, yeah. it, it's amazing that for me that I'm able to get away with you know, two or three hours of time, you know, the people that I admire, you know, um, a lot and grow up with, with and same with like, people from electronic musician bands in Germany. Yeah. Has, I like it. It's, it's amazing that, <laughs> you, you know, you work with Kate um, uh, throughout most of her career. Do you remember, I think she was at the time was using the, the, the Fairlife CMI yeah. Um, and different, you know, atypical percussion approaches. And what do you recall about that? What for somebody who is not a, a drummer, what what she ended up using that machine for? Um. Oh well, she loved the Fairlight because it gave her sounds that um, no one else could have. Yeah. You know, um, I remember Del Palmer, who was her boyfriend and engineer at the time. He used to go around, rec you know, sampling everything. You know, he'd get aerosols and, you know, psst, make a sample, yeah. um, hit a door, boom, that's another sample. And then he'd make these 
these these patterns, these percussion patterns, and he was very good at it. I must say, um, some beautiful patterns on on the albums that I get then got to play play drums over. Um, he didn't actually pro program drum parts on the Fairlight. It was more percussion and, and uh, unusual sounds. Um, and of course, the Fairlight. I think the first time he used Fairlight was on Babushka mm -hmm. uh, with the broken glass. You know. <laughs> The broke, you know, the, the smashing glass sound. Um, and after that, um, they use Kate used it quite heavily to start songs off and to get sounds that were unique to her rather than factory sounds. You know, she, she was very much into being individual, you know. Um, so yeah, that, that worked really well. Um, but as I said, you know, the only thing that that does is it sort of, it, it, it ties everything down to a, it has to be either machined or free, you know, and I, I kind of prefer the free approach, but as, as the eighties kind of went on, um, progressed, there was more sort of live and machine playing together. So kind of just, it was part of what technology had provided and everyone was jumped on the bandwagon. So kind of had to go with it really, but you know, it's, it, 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 you know, having said that it did give birth to some really interesting textures and rhythms and just something different i guess but you know we, we find ourselves now we're going back to more natural natural playing with the people are trying to be more natural with their performances now which is which is also good i think it's good to i mean like bruno mars if you listen to bruno mars records you might as you you're, you could be listening to old soul records from from the 60s but with well, with uh, yeah. yeah that's that and or stevie wonder from back in the day you know he's very high quality musicianship and great recording but all very live you know with lots of musicians and brass players and yeah. you you have any, one opinion like probably you are answering the question one way or another versus traditional drums versus more electronic drum like uh, used by propaganda or the pet Shop boys or that kind of stuff um well i've done both i i mean when we when we did um I'm thinking of the album. Uh, it would have been, I think it's the Central World. I was using, um, I was using electronic pads. Yeah. Uh, with real symbols. I had real symbols. It was better with real, real hi hat, real symbols, but then uh, electronic tom toms and bass drum and snare drum. Uh, and I did that for a few years, actually. Um, it was great. Uh, Kate loved it because um, she could, you know, we say we need a bass drum sound. So I'd get, get my sampler and I'd sort of, I got about a thousand bass drums in there and I just hit the bass drum and turn the knob and change the bass drum. And they'd stop me, you know, stop me and buy one, you know, Oh yeah. I we'll like that one. Yeah. We'll have that one. And then right. A snare drum <laughs> change, change, change. Yeah. There were that one. We'll have that one, you know? So once we got the bass drum and the snare drum, uh, which was a uniquely new sound for a track, we'd go off and record the track, you know, it's, it's just great. It was a great way to work. It was a great way to work. There is a time, right. I mean, that kind of stuff was very popular. It was popular for probably maybe 20 years or so. Right. And yeah, people, people now drumming like yourself or musicians, you go back to old school, you know, play with a real drum and no more electronic drum. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a different, but people, uh, um, some musicians prefer analog versus digital or uh, analog to a certain extent and then they mix everything and uh you know with the digital it's funny you should say that about the analog thing because and any any um engineers that i know who who were there when we were recording to analog a lot of, most of them prefer digital because they rem they remember yeah. what problems analog gave them Yep. You know, tape hiss um, and the change, the sound. Because I, I remember this vividly on a, on a on a Kate book when we were doing Babushka and Breathing yep. in, in uh, Abbey Road Studio 2. Um, I came back to listen to to, to our performance mm -hmm. and uh, John Kelly, who was um, the engineer, <laughs> yeah, I said to him, oh, that's a really good drum sound, John. That's brilliant. And he said, I wish you could hear it before it goes to tape. Because it's a different sound when it's when I, I could never hear what it sounded. But now that digital is uh, 
is the thing. You 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 hear what it actually is like, whereas the tape used to squash it and change it and make it Correct. different. Yeah. And he didn't, you know, he. I got the impression that he didn't like the fact that it had to change when it went down as a tape. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. It's, I think it's mostly young young people and young producers that have no experience of of tape that say, "Oh, tape is best. Tape is best." But they they don't really know what they're talking about because they weren't there. They, they've never recorded to tape. Well, they have probably they haven't seen or hear both, right? The the analog, the taping versus the digital directly and uh, yeah, yeah i mean just because a record sounds great doesn't mean it was because it was on analog it would generally the most important thing would be because it'd be it would be a great engineer and a great studio um and great musicians to, who who know that they have to create the sound and get a good sound out of the drums and get a good sound out of everything um rather than electronically faking it after so it was just a lot of that yeah but um what well, how you um you mentioned abbey road how it's like to be there i mean i of course i've never been inside i've been outside many many times when i go to london but um never been able to enter there and uh, but i will next year uh, somebody helping me out and i will go inside and take some pictures how it's like yeah to like that uh, Oh, it was, it was, so it's always been magic. Even, you know, when, uh, it's Courtney Rebel in this, like 1975, when we recorded an album in studio two, we, we were kind of just looking at the walls and thinking, wow, the Beatles played in here. You know, that's what everybody does. Everybody says the same thing. They go in this room and they know that the Beatles have been there and recorded yeah. all those wonderful records that they love. Um, even the first album, I think it was, uh, please, please me. They did the whole thing in one day live, you know, um, yeah, it is, a, it is a magical... I mean, it didn't used to be called Abbey Road Studio, Studios. It used to be called EMI Studios. Yeah, wow. Well, and, and in Abbey Road. But because of the Beatles and the Abbey Road album, they've rebranded it as as Abbey Road Studios. Um, so the magic, yeah, the magic. The fact the magic has kind of increased uh, because of probably the passage of time, you know. Um, but is it... If you have the option... Or you or yourself as a musician or for an engineer, is it that place? As I say, I've never been there, but is the nostalgia of having play or having you know do a recording there? You know why that different than if you were to play, for example, a more technically sophisticated studio like the one for Peter Gabriel, or Real World Studios. It's, yeah there's 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 really no difference um yeah in the in the quality of the recording because you know the recording is is what it is isn't it it's, it's just yeah. great quality great quality gear um it's most mostly nostalgia I mean, you don't have to record in uh, in abbey road studios to get the best sound in the world i mean it's course, yeah. i mean for, in fact george martin had his own studio air, air, air london and uh, that's where we recorded the kick inside yeah. We didn't oh, record yeah, it at yeah. we recorded that at uh, Oxford Circus in London. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that, it was just uh, as good. Great. It was just as good. I mean, it doesn't you know, it makes no difference. Um it's just I guess it's you know, it's it's this nostalgic thing. The Beatles were in this room. <gasps> you know. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. That's... And it's like the room I have seen many pictures from the inside. It still is kept like in the if, if the picture I have seen are accurate, like in the 70s, 80s, I mean, like all wood and the same painting or it's not yeah, fancy um, at, at the, the real world studio with Peter Gabriel with real wood, with metals, beautiful done. And very yeah, no, and actually, no, actually, they did. They did refurbish uh, Abbey Road yeah. Studio too. They did they eventually, because I remember when we used to be there in the 70s, Yeah, you look up up on the ceiling, there was like fabric stuff that was all torn oh yeah and dust all black dust on it and everything and so that but they were scared they were scared to touch the room because they didn't want to ruin the uh you know the the um the history and everything but eventually they had to um, but it looks it looks the same they just 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 cleaned up the ceiling um and they used to have these big um what was like cloth strips of 
uh, drapes. The wall. Yeah, yeah, I think they're still there. They're still there. They just, they just. I think they put new ones or new clean ones or cleaned them or something like that, and then just painted the walls. You know? But um, they didn't change much. They didn't change much. Wow. Yeah, probably they will never. They will do that. Uh, what can you tell us about um, the album of with Alan Parson on Try Anything Once, where you end up uh, co-authoring the 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 hit uh, Mr. Time? Which is a very good one. Oh right! Um, actually, incidentally, that album, that album, try anything once. That was that was all um, played on the ele electronic pads and real cymbals, like I was telling you. Yeah. So there was no acoustic drums on that album at all. It's just all electronic. It's all played live. I played it live, but it's an electronic kit with real cymbals. So, um, what do I remember about Mr. Time? Oh, well, I remember right um, the original version. Um, when it was a band that I was in, it, it wasn't a, a, a gigging or touring band. We just used to record stuff at my studio um, called the Dreamfield, which we didn't get anywhere. We didn't. We never got a deal or anything. We just sort of fizzled out. But um, it was a nice year of writing songs, and that was one of the songs that we wrote together. Um, Jackie Copeland was the girl that sang it, and she was in the Dreamfield with me and uh, a guy called Rick Driscoll. Um, in fact, we, we, we released the album as, as library music just a couple of years ago. No, in fact, about three or four years ago. Um, and the library company have promised us that they will release it as an album, a dedicated album, you know, with artwork and everything at some point as well. So, but it, it's far from ever being a hit. You know, it's just um, one of those things. It was a nice studio album. It's got an atmosphere about it. It's three eighties. Um, but Mr. Time, yeah, that's uh, when I when we're, we were sort of pitching our songs to Alan, I played him that one and he loved it because it's kind of sounds a bit Pink Floydy. Right. Yeah. I like it yeah, because I like progressive music. So, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was quite, quite an interesting uh, aside. I like that album, actually. So try anything once. Mm -hmm. Some good stuff on it. There's a lot of um, very various songwriters, but um, it was a nice, well recorded album. Well played, but it was a bit of a flop, you know. Didn't get anywhere, so um, unfortunately, we were yep. hoping to be, uh, we were hoping to take up take up where Eric Wolfson left off, but it was not to be. <laughs> you have to, re you know, it's, uh, uh, to replace the guy. And um, the Time Machine was a very good album as well. Uh, that you end up um, again composing a lot of material, like the the opening and closing track that you know, no future in the past and press rewind. I oh, press rewind, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I'd hope that press rewind might have uh, done better than it did, but say la vie. It was another sort of very moderately received album. But you know, it's it's hard to you can't keep recreating the past. I mean, you know, once Eric Eric Wolfson had, had died, um, he he, you know, he took he really took the heart and soul of the project with him didn't he because of, of yeah. the, the style the style of writing i mean i mean i i wrote a song uh, or co-wrote a song called one day to fly which was on uh, it's on the time machine wasn't it no no sorry it was on on air no it wasn't um yeah on air um and that was a big long beatly projecty epic with lots of orchestra and everything um but you know, I think I think that time had passed. You know, trying to sort of trying to be Eric Wolfson was was not something anyone should have dared try to do. Because he, I remember when we uh, went out sort of doing some touring with uh, with the band, and we were playing a lot of the new stuff. Um, this was after Eric had died, and our keyboard player Richard Cottle, he used to get quite drunk at the time. Uh, which he's, he doesn't drink anymore, but uh, he used to just go off into these what's the matter with you guys why don't you just oh, no this was before eric died sorry he hadn't died he, he, he just he'd split up with alan he said what's the matter with you guys you keep writing these rubbish songs and this stupid music just get eric back get him back you know <laughs> oh man that's a good one yeah and he was right actually he was right i mean it it, it was <laughs> the project is not the project without Eric, I mean, he was, he was, 
it was him that sort of created the magic with Alan, you know, so, and we're all trying to sort of make it work without him, you know, but, um, I think yeah, Eric, we, yeah. Eric we died, have... sorry, I, uh, to interrupt, uh, Eric died too, too soon, I think, man, I mean, it, I yeah, the poor fellow, he, he sort of got this, I think it was kidney cancer or something, and then he got yeah, a right. kidney removed, and, uh, and then it came up somewhere else, and then he battled that with chemo, and then it, Got it got better and then came back and it kept coming back and in the end I think he just said oh look you know just don't bring me back I've had enough of this you know it was just too much misery mm. but, um, yeah it's a shame it'd be lovely if he was still around yeah yeah, yeah we're, we're all very fond of him yeah uh, looking back in your life um, you have a, a, a very close collaboration with with Alan Parsons what 20 something years now and uh Good, good memories, bad memories, good times. Oh no, no, oh, no. Oh, are great, you, great, are great you memories. Are you discussing, getting? What can you, can you, you know, without without a lawyer being present, what can you? If you can recall a couple of memories, a couple of uh, times that you people don't know that much about him and Alan. Oh, I have great memories about Alan. We, we yeah. one of the one of one of the great things, one of the wonderful things about uh, playing with the project, is that. Every evening around about sort of eight o'clock, we'd all go out to dinner to these most fabulous restaurants every night, you know, and it was, oh, just, oh, heaven. The best Chinese, the best Indian food, and yeah. the best French food and the best of everything. And we'd drink wine and beer and eat and just make merry. It was the most, oh, God, what, what, a, what a time we had. And then, of course, over dinner, it would be, sort of, you know, stories and laughs and, um and great um just great bonding memory. you know bonding of, of uh, after doing a great day in the studio um and then sometimes we come back to the studio and maybe we had a little bit too much to drink after dinner why after dinner we drink you know you know and um but we always stopped at that point but um there was one evening where um we'd had so lots of wine and uh, and drink and everything and then uh, Lawrence Cottle, the bass player, he pulled out a, um, a spliff, you know, yeah, yeah. and he gave me some and it was really strong. It was like skunk, you know, something like that. And then we got back to the studio and we we're completely stoned. And Eric said, um, right, I'd like to try to do another track now. <laughs> we're going to just routine another song. And I think, oh, no, I looked at Lawrence and we looked at each other with dread, you know, we we're, so we're, we're like jelly, you know, we couldn't do anything. <laughs> couldn't do anything yeah. No, and thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, after about 10 minutes, uh, Eric said, oh, like, let's just leave it till tomorrow. And we thought, oh, whew, you know. <laughs> yeah. I remember that Lenny Sakatek mentioned a couple of times that he, he, he used to be in France and um, they used to go to a Thai restaurant, I remember, if I remember correctly. And uh, and uh, with Alan Parsons after, you know, like you say, after they work hard on the day, about 7 p.m., you will go out to. Yeah. And uh, that kind of stuff. That was. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you guys, uh, well, at least Lenny Sagatek is working all the, you know, legal issues uh, for putting the project together. I think it was. Uh, a lot of discussion about it was possible to use the name or not, right? And but I think um, uh, Lenny was mentioned that you know after all the legal issues are resolved, you know I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just a guy who likes music. That you will be able to perhaps um, you know play next year and hopefully put a band together and with Dave Bainbridge as well that I have the opportunity to yeah well that is that 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 is the plan um yeah yeah but um it, it, it sort of got scuppered slightly by this legal thing going on between Alan and our manager and yeah. um so it's it, it's it's kind of difficult we we need to find Come on we ground, to, right? well we need to find some a agents that are interested if it's, that's all it boils down to you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of ready to go and play if, if somebody wants us to go and play. So we need to find an agent that can book a tour um, and then we'll go and then we'll go and do it. But um, it's been it's it's sort of failed so far because of all the litigation and the, and the lawyers. And it's made it's made it difficult to do that. But, um, you know, whatever, if we can, we will. If we can't, we will just give it up. You know, yeah. so. 
it, it just mean, depends. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, all of you, like yourself and Dave Bainbridge and uh, Lenny Sakatek, you guys do other stuff as well. So you're not waiting for just, you know, that particular tour to happen or you don't depend on that tour. You, you do other stuff. If it works out, it would be, uh, you know, great. I mean, for me, as I said before, I'm, I'm not planning to promote or give my opinion one way or another. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I hope that the, the, the legal issues can work it out for me from a musician point of view, right? I love to listen to good music, you know. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, the legal issues are are, are, are so, sorted now. That, that yeah, it's, yeah. It's all the agreements are there, so we are free to go and play. Okay. Um, it's just that we're not free to go and play with the guy that was promising all kinds of big tours so he can't he can't do it he, he's been restricted from working with us um or so with another we, agent whatever hopefully well it, i don't know i mean uh, it yeah it's it, it depends on on what faith uh, another agent has a we we certainly don't we don't want um i don't know we we, we just we just need a, an agent with faith to book us to do gigs and then we'll do them you know so it's, that's it the, the keys the keys of the kingdom are in their hands really we we can't force promoters to book us but we we need someone that can approach them uh, and get it going so we're working on it at the moment so um i'll, I'll drop you a line if we get success yeah, i would love to go and, and uh, see you play live and Alan, Alan person is kind of he was sick for a while. I think he got got an operation. He's slowing down. I think he only did two, three gigs recently. And uh, I but... saw that he he has a big chair. Only so I think he was sitting back on it. He's probably got still yeah, got some in, injury. Um, yeah. But um, no, I wish him well. I didn't like to think. I know. I know we were sort of fighting and everything. But yeah, I, I, I do wish him well. I mean, you know, he, he is an old friend, and I of course, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I was quite, I was quite sad actually that. It, it kind of got to where it did with lawyers and everything. I thought I'd learned my lesson, you know, with um, being sucked into litigation and lawyers and people being sued and everything. It's like I managed to I managed to divorce my wife well, two wives. We managed to divorce without lawyers. We just we just got around a table and said, what do you want? What do I want? What have we got? Yeah, okay with good. And, uh, yeah, done is... job done job done and yeah. no no lawyers and that's how i was hoping um this was going to be i, I did try to i did try to email alan but i think he was a bit upset with the fact that we were going out under under a, a name that he was not happy with and um, which in re retrospect i wasn't happy with it either and i and it was fact it was me that got uh, our manager to Ditch, ditch this stupid idea of calling it the Alan Parsons Project, the original Alan Parsons Project band, which I never liked, but uh, yeah. it kind of got overridden and all the lawyers thought it was okay. And I just thought, oh dear, I don't like this. Um, yeah. But I got, I got it, I got it stamped out in the end, and we changed, changed it to just the project, which is fine, yeah. which is what it should have been from the beginning, and we wouldn't have had all these problems, which is Correct, yeah. really, which is really, really lamentable. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, the lawyers are the ones that are making money. They want to prolong the stamp because they get paper hour and this and that, and, and then you end up ruining friendship for, you know, that people that you knew for or you play with like for third, twenty, thirty years, like you know. You know well, that was you know the the, the whole plan, the whole plan for as far as I was concerned about approaching Alan legally was to get just mediation. You know, say look. What do you, you get everyone around the table and say this is this is this is what Alan wants, this is what we want. What should we do? But it took two years and it got deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. And to a point where you can't get out. Once you're into that, you can't get out. Yeah. Um, because you know, um all the language, the legal language, I don't understand a word of it anyway. It's but it's like you think you well, just let the lawyers take care of it. But then when you do that, it just goes from bad to worse. And yeah. it's, it's it's one of the most lamentable periods of my life. And it sort of sort of destroyed our relationship with Alan, which is really I'm really unhappy about. And 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 Eric Wolfson's company. And uh, I don't like the fact that we're that we, we had to sort of become what 
what seems to be like enemies and I, I, it doesn't feel good yeah, yeah, what, yeah, but anyway, what, anyway what's it what's the worth it's like you fighting with you know with kate bush that you play with her for many years a great album the best track of all time maybe and uh you know but you yeah, know. yeah yeah well it is it is what it is we just have to make the best of it Maybe. um but um you know, I, 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 you know as i said as i said I, I you know i do wish alan well and i hope of course, he's a very nice person yeah very good he's, he's a fine guy yeah um and I, I hope his back doesn't stop him from doing what he needs to do yeah i i don't have that many many questions left and uh, i want you to if you can elaborate on the library album that you're putting together um I think you 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 end up creating them and you sell the right to be used in TVs, movies, or how how they work. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. Um, it used to be called library music, but they call it production music now. Production music. Um, so really, what it is, yeah, when you get a d directors, producers, and creatives that are making uh, TV programs and movies, uh, documentaries, they always want music, but they they can't they can't really afford to just book. You know, if they want sort of like the Rolling Stones type music, they can't say, oh, well, let's use you all the Rolling Stones music because they'll pay so much money for it, that, that, it right the, the pro, that the program just goes bust, you know. So they think, well, what are we going to do? We, we can do some stuff that sounds like 70s rock or if they want Spanish music, so you do them a flamenco track. If, if it's uh, it, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, I, I tend not to sort of um, do as much uh, you know, like I wouldn't do a flamenco album. I've done a couple of flamenco tracks with a friend who plays flamenco guitar in the past. But um, some of the more recent ones I've done are um, like uh, glam rock. Yeah. You remember 70s glam rock, you know, T-Rex, get Gary Glitter as well, unfortunately, but, um, yeah. you know, a few others. And I made an album of that with my guitarist friend. And uh, sounds great. Love it. It was good fun to do it. And um it's on the shelves now waiting to be used. Uh, another one I did was, um, it's like a sort of, it, I did it myself. It was, um, it's like, you know, the music from the Godfather and uh, all the sort of mandolins and uh, clarinets and yeah. stuff like that. Jewish sort of Russian sort of Italian music, um, like from the sixties, you know? So I, I did an album of that, um, which is, uh, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's, it, it's, like, it's, it's great that you do it, you polish it, you do it once, you offer to, I don't know, directors or movie companies or television, and you get paid every time that the track is played in a commercial or TV in the spot. And it's, it's, it's good to have some. Well, that's what it's for. That's income, you know. Yeah, yeah. Have, it's. it's it's a good, it's a good, it, well, it used to be an amazing source of income back in about 40 years ago. Some of the guys that used to do all the writing library music, they would have like he helicopter pads and they have their own helicopter and stuff like that. <laughs> they get, because there was only a few of them. There wasn't very many, but now everybody is making library music. Every musician, you know, they're all making library music. So it's another market that's been saturated. So it doesn't make much money, but occasionally, you know, that you get a track that gets used in Japan or something and you get yeah. 500 euros or 500 pounds or whatever, yeah. 600 pounds, 1,000 pounds or 20 pennies or something. You know, it can be, it can be, go from nothing to big, but generally speaking, it's kind of a steady thing that if you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of tracks out there, you've got a steady income of, you know, a decent amount like almost it's almost like a pension really you can treat it as a pension but yeah. um it's, it's not music that you, you it's not music that anyone would sit down and listen to it's uh it's not like yeah. that as opposed to a spotify right that you need to have millions of hits like genesis or peter gabriel or kate bush's of this world alan parcel of this world to get a, a you know get a a check for 300 dollars or something you know well, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, well, this is the thing. Um, the 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 big money now is is in live performance, but also in sync. You know where they sync your music to film. Yeah. In yeah. fact, that's how the Kate Bush, the Running Up the Hill, became so big because it was synced to Stranger Things. That's right. Yeah. Netflix. Yeah. Netflix used it for Stranger Things, um, and all of a sudden, it's it's like number one globally. It's like what? Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. 
And for three well, months, it, it was top 10 for three months. It's like in global. It's like, phew, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so that was a nice little present for me, you know, as uh, so I'm kind of um, daddy cool or even granddaddy cool, you know, now because I've got grandkids and, and uh, kids that are kind of think that I'm cool again, you know. <laughs> so it's... Yeah, hey, my, my grandpa good, yeah. used to be in the truck that you listen to. Series, so. That's right. Yeah, they're Don't saying, yeah, my, grand, my granddad. <laughs> And then, then their friends are saying, "Yeah, I don't believe that you're lying." You know, <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's, no, it's great. It's lovely. It's lovely. So my understanding is you're going to be touring with the Steve Harley again, and uh, you're doing some gigs with him. Uh, yeah, we're doing about five or six shows in December with him. So it'd be like a little mini tour, mini tour. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they're a lovely bunch of fellows to work with. We're all great pals great friends so um that will be a lot of fun good for you yeah i my my note says that you play with uh john anderson and alice cooper as well that that for the symphony. oh yeah the, uh, the what do they call it the ultimate british rock symphony i think it was called yeah symphony it? tour yeah the ultimate british rock symphony tour or something like that well that's another that's another one you know because when i was 17 i used to work in a shop in the king's road chelsea and I used to work in this basement and I had my little cassette player and I all day, all day long, I was listening to the Yes album. Yeah, round yeah. and round and round and round. Um, and of course, the other album close to the edge, I think it's got Roundabout, you know, the song Roundabout. Yeah. So we played Roundabout with him and also Owner of a Lonely Heart, which is an incredible track. Yeah, for, uh, it's yeah. another one of those things. It was like it ticked another box in my sort of my... Uh, Correctly. My, my teens, you know, like I got to work with John Anderson and he, he really yeah. liked our performance. And it was like, oh, yeah, what a joy. What a joy that was. And Alice Cooper as well. We, but we didn't play an Alice Cooper song. We played um, My Generation, Who the Who's My Generation. And uh, and, and another one, I think it was uh, um, a, a Pink Floyd number. It might have been Leave Those Kids Alone or something like that. Wow. Hey, teacher, Leave Those Kids Alone. But with Alice, Alice Cooper, yeah. Yeah, who else played on that now? Oh, Tony Hadley was on that. And of course, Alan Parsons was part of it as well. So we became the house band. So I got to play with, with all the artists. Yeah, I, I saw recently the current version of Jazz, right? With Steve Howe and new, new people. And I have seen also um, Ian Anderson many, many times by himself with his band. It's some uh, unbelievable, man, that those... Or Rush. I mean, they're a band that 50 years later still, or Genesis, you know, 50 years later still touring, playing, doing well. People keep on buying the music or the vinyl or, you know, for example, you know, Peter Gabriel uh, announced a new tour and I'm a stupid guy. I'm going to be flying to Europe to see Peter Gabriel in Italy and then go to the UK again to see the guy because I like his music, and uh, it's amazing that people, you know, you know, it's still after 40, 50 years, you know, they're 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 great. They're playing great. They're great. Yeah. It's like it's like it's like Kate Bush. If Kate Bush announced, you know, a tour of twenty days or twenty gigs somewhere, the ticket go like that. Whether the ticket costs two hundred pound or five hundred pound or so kind of people would put the money, would put the credit card and, yeah. and, and go yeah. out there. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So don't you, you do you always have to travel far for, for do see concerts? Don't they ever come to your where you No, live? I, I go, yeah, here I'm able to see close to between 40 and 50 gigs a year. So I here I go everywhere. There's there's some bands that they don't come to the United States. Right. Okay. Uh, like yeah. Bands like Word Phonics or Simple Minds, Simple Red, and and uh, and so forth. So oh, I play. With, I play. I play with Simple Minds as well. One, one you, time. You, yeah. Feel free to elaborate on that. Yeah. You know they used to they used to be fans of Courtney Rebel. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, because when I played, I played um, in Antwerp at the Proms, and they, yeah. they came just. It was just Jim and Charlie, you know, the guitarist. Yeah. And. Um, I was in the house band, so I was playing with everybody, plus Alan. 
Um, but then when Jim and Charlie came down, they came up to me and they said, oh, it's great playing with you. We're big fans of Cockney Rebel when we were kids, you know. Wow. They're not that much younger. I think they were probably about seven or eight years younger than us. Yeah. But when they were, you know, when they were sort of young, young lads that used to come and see us in Scotland when we played there, you know, in 75, I think. So yeah. it was great to be able to play with them because they, you know, um, what was the name? Uh, What's the name of that big hit? Won't get. I oh, know. I I've forgotten the name of their hit, but uh, do, 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 do. don't forget about me. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, that's so. Cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful that's track, man. Oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. The funny thing is that that's the only track that they didn't write. It was some American guy that wrote that apparently, and the really? I think the record I think the record company persuaded them to record it, but just as well they did because it was a big hit, wasn't it? Oh yeah, playing, yeah playing that yeah. was fantastic with those guys. Yeah. Quite great. And I, and I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, I want to have the opportunity to see. The last time I went to Europe um, this this year, I went twice. See Eric Clapton play at the Royal Albert Hall, and then oh, yeah, the last three shows um, of Genesis playing at the two when with Phil Collins announced hey. We come to the end. This is it. We we don't need the money. We have done okay. We don't want. It's hard for us to travel and so on and so forth. And uh, I was there, so it's you know as a yeah as a music lover, uh, if you will, and uh, I, I, I have been able to you know get some satisfaction. Like uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm feeling I'm going there, so. It's a shame that Phil's health declined like that because he was one of the best drummers to come out of uh, yeah. out of the UK. Um, what a what a fantastic drummer he was! Yeah, it's just so sad that he had to sort of have that sort of problem with the neck and the arms and everything. And yeah, yeah, he but was. You get to a point so where the body doesn't work anymore, and hey, you you have that much money on the bank, and you don't want to tour. You want to be with your kids, your grandkids. You know what? What's the point, right? Eventually, you need to say, well, you know, unless you have to work, right? So you know, no many bands could have yeah. played that, right? True. So people, yes, people true. To, yeah. People to keep on playing and keep on touring and keep on recording to pay the bills. Other so bands, they say, hey, you know, I think Genesis recently sold the music right to one organization for like three hundred million dollars or so, and uh, so they they don't they don't need the aggravation. And uh, they want to enjoy their life, whatever you know, whatever they want to do, and and, and stuff like that. And uh, plus, going to London, I mean, London is becoming very, very expensive. I mean, they not just the fly, the fly is not expensive, but you know, taking a cab and the hotels and the meal is very expensive for young young kids that just finished high school and try to make it into the workforce to. Yeah, that's what people don't live in. Live that's outside, right. Yeah, yeah. London. Yeah, and it's worse now than it's ever been. I mean, just everything is. Even simple things are getting really expensive. You go into just a food shop and you think, "Wow, I saw, I, I might, I've got a Turkish um, d- um, mini market over the road." Yeah, and um, I quite you know, I quite often like to buy a little little wedge of you know Parmesan cheese, Italian Parmesan. Of course, yeah. I put my pasta sauce. Yeah. Which is normally about three pounds, just under four pounds. Over there is seven pounds for yeah. a little piece of cheese. I, I thought I'm not, I'm not going to eat that cheese if it's seven pounds. It's like ridiculous. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. Well, um, so everything. So I think it's the dairy products and uh, have, have become very expensive. Milk and cheese and, and butter. For some reason that they they've 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 just gone whew, up in price. Yeah, with the but, cost of inflation, everything it uh, it. Uh, Everything's going up, you know, and uh, and uh, what can you do? Man? Hopefully, inflation will go away, and we could, you know, the the virus, COVID, hopefully, will go away one day forever, and no more variation of this or vaccine or this or that. Man, I wanna, I would like to see a simple world, man, with no fight, and you know, Putin invading other countries and i don't know we're even crazy that I mean, I, it's one I thing after that. another isn't it it's one thing yeah. after but i i think i think the main the main thing that um has affected the whole world is the lockdowns mm. i think um paying everybody money for staying at home 
was probably a big, big mistake. That's probably the biggest mistake ever. I don't know whether they did it in America, but they certainly did it here. Yeah, People yeah. getting paid wages for staying at home. I mean, it's, oh, it's outrageous. I mean, what they, you know, what a lot of us now thinking back on it, they should have done was they should have protected the vulnerable and let the young, strong, healthy get out and can continue working. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 what the trouble is that you get one young person that dies from it, and the, the whole world closes down. And it's like the panic is more. It, it was was more um, was just made everything seem worse. Well, uh, and really also, the uh, people that used to get paychecks by no working or doing this, now they want everything for free. Yeah, they don't want to go back to school. They don't want to go to their job. They take the jobs, and they want to expect they want to work. Will take them forever for. Until they're six years old, you know. It's... Yeah, and they all want to work from home. And, uh, you know, it's not a good idea to always work from home. I mean, it's nice if you can now occasionally. But when you're not with other people, there's no there's no interaction. There's no, it's, it's not healthy. It's really not healthy. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Sure, that's all I have, man. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending the time talking to me. And uh, hope to see you in London. Hopefully we can get together for dinner with... Lenny, Lenny, and all the other musicians. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we're around, yeah. we'll see you. Yeah. So you, um, do you edit this? It's very long, isn't it? Do you do do edits? No, I upload it. I no, I don't. Maybe I do it part one and part two. Oh, part I two. see. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. But people, yeah. people like this stuff. I mean, um, with Dave Bainbridge, I talked two hours. Sagatek two two hours, and then many others, and uh, people are. Uh, because as I say at the beginning, for me, I want to see the human side of the person or the musician or the player or drummer in your case. And uh, and I got to know a little bit about yourself and uh, people like that, you know. I never talk that much about the hits and uh, because everybody knows about the hits, right? So yeah, I want to yeah. know the human side of the guy and uh, of the musician, and, you know, how the session were, were with Kate Bush and how is Alan Parson or Eric Wilson is more in the real life? Yeah. So I might take it yeah. a little bit different. So and, uh, it was a very, uh, very nice meeting you. Very nice talking to you. I will send you once I upload the interview to uh, Facebook, um, well, to YouTube and then Facebook. I'll, I will send you a direct link for you and uh, I will send you the transcript and everything. And uh, Oh, great. We will get together and uh, you will sign some, some CDs and some Sure, yeah, of course. I know yeah. we to send when we get together, man. Yeah, actually, uh, one thing is, uh, you know, you know the, the the one show we did with the project in Barcelona. Yeah, the orchestral show we recorded that, and I mixed it. I mixed it. I just spent months mixing it, um, and it really is a quite a special album. Um, you know, it was at, we only did one performance. We just had one eight days rehearsal, right? Yeah, we just yeah we had eight days rehearsal, and then we played the show. And we recorded the whole thing uh, and videoed it as well. We can't, we can't really use the video at the moment, but um, if, uh, if we can get some, uh, some, some interest for touring, we will definitely be releasing that album. Yeah. Um, and it's quite special. It's not, it's not like any, anything. Um, I know Alan's, uh, Alan Parsons has recorded a lot of live albums, but this one sounds very, very different. Um, it's just got a, Got a, it's got a thing about it that I think we really like. Yeah. And you say it's going to be for sale, or the video board? Oh, like, like uh, well, it will be. It will, it will be at some. It will be at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. We what we want to do is we want, if, we, if we can get a tour, get some tour booked for next year. Yeah. We want to coincide and have an album as well. So oh, I got you. I got you. Um, yeah. We were we were all ready to to, to do this in uh, for November. We were supposed to be going to South America for this November. You know, in like next week we were supposed to be. To yeah. there, but then it sort of fell through and something went wrong and we were almost going to release the album as well but we decided no hang on wait and then the the, the, the dates didn't happen so we're all we're waiting for it to happen but um yeah we're, we're yeah, we up, argentina chile or yeah we were gonna we were going to chile and argentina that's yeah, exactly yeah. where we were going yeah and brazil um yeah. But um and the promoter was really really up for it but i think he felt a bit rushed because it was too close this was like last a month ago. Yeah, I thought it's too close. We need more time. You know, if we book something for next May, then we got plenty of time to promote it, plenty of time to think about the album. Yeah. 
but I'm really excited about the album. Um, it's uh, it's it's a really lovely listening listening experience, especially um, Lenny sings a lot of the songs. Well, he sings quite a lot of the set, um, but he sings on, on songs that he didn't sing on the albums as well. See, and yeah. he does a really good job. I have to tell you, he sings Old and Wise, you know, that song, and Time. Um, and these were songs where we thought, oh, it needs someone different to do it with a high voice that sounds like Eric and everything. But yeah. then he said, no, look, give me a chance. And he did it, recorded it. And I said, man, that's, that is just. Yeah. Yeah. Some, that, think about yeah there's some that, tracks like, that are very difficult. And, uh, you know, Eric, even Eric Wilson, you know, it's. Uh, uh, it they're they're hard for any any great singer to sing the stuff. There, there's some Adam person song that are very difficult to sing, no matter what you do, no matter how yeah. good you, do, you know. Well, I remember Eric had a very high voice, yeah, he sing very very high. Um, and he used to work hard to do the lyrics. Uh, sorry, the um the vocals. Vocals. Alan, Alan, Alan Alan was great at doing vocals because he can hear the slightest little thing and he said, no, we need to do this again, that, do that again. And then you get a perfect vocal with no auto-tune or any of that shit. Yeah. Um, but Eric's vocals were always just perfect. Um, but Lenny, uh, you know, you know, he's got a, so he's got a, he's got a very soulful voice, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but when yeah. he sings the straighter, straighter songs, he's still got that little soul thing in him that uh, puts it, his personality is in the songs rather than because in the past when we when we used to tour with um, Alan, Alan used to select this singer to do that and that singer to do that, and then they would try and copy the tone of the singer that's on the record. And they'd, in fact, mm -hmm. it, Alan's Alan's guy do that now. They sort of try to sing in the same register, or like sound like Colin Blunston or whatever. Whereas Lenny doesn't do that; he's just himself. That's right. Yeah, but because he's an original player a singer with the with the with the with the, the project well, he can do that and you say well that's right he's one of the boys you know he's one of the guys in in the original lineup which was quite a big lineup but he, he was still back there and played on the records so now you, you'll like some of the versions that uh, you hear with lenny yeah. singing them we've got another yeah. great singer as well called sam sam blue who's a fantastic singer he sings the more rocky ones to give lenny a rest but between the two of them they're the best two singers that we've ever ever played live with um with the, with the project as a team they just sort of their voices blend together just when they yeah. sing together when they sing in unison at the same time it sounds like a new voice really yeah it's beautiful because yeah they, they, yeah sam has got a sort of rock edge to him and lenny's got a beautiful soft round kind of soulful thing yeah. and you blend them together and you get someone else it's fantastic you'll love it you'll love it yeah, I'm looking anyway. forward to that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Lenny is an unbelievable guy. Plus, Lenny is a very good person as well, you know. Uh, like David Payton and then Dave Bainbridge. And uh, course, they're yeah. great personalities, you know. I, uh, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. To, uh, yeah, yeah. We're all good buddies. That's right. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for your time. Man. Have a good evening there, man. It was very nice talking to you. Yeah. And, I, and I will see you very soon, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. No problem. Take it easy. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye, man.